our meeting. I, um, my apologies uh, for running a little bit behind. Um, welcome to our September 9th County Commission meeting. It's a little bit different. It's a Thursday afternoon and Thursday evening instead of Thursday, uh, Tuesday, but uh, glad to have you here and those who are online uh, as well. Um, we will have an invocation by Reverend Clarence Williams. He'll be online um, doing the invocation and then Commissioner Gerard will uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. And before we do that, I just wanted to draw everybody's uh, thoughts and prayers to 9-11, um, to which is obviously this Saturday, uh, the 20th anniversary. Um, a lot of people, um, you hear stories and you hear about families are still recovering from that day. Our country still is recovering from that day. Um, and um, this, this Saturday will be a little special uh, in many ways. The 9-11 memorial service at Curlew Hills uh, up in uh, Dunedin, Palm Harbor area will have a keynote speaker, um, Garrett Lindgren. He's a, a retired uh, 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 firefighter from New York uh, City. Uh, a musical guest, Lee Greenwell, will be here to sing his song. Uh, Master of Ceremonies, John Wilson. There'll be some survivors that are there that from, that, from that day, uh, helicopter flyovers, and a lot of folks there to pay their respects to, to a really horrible day in our history. But uh, I just really wanted to just take a moment of silence before we go to um, uh, Pastor uh, Reverend Williams to do the invocation. So just a moment of silence, please. Okay, thank you. And uh, Reverend Williams, uh, we can stand for the invocation and then followed by the pledge. You're on, Reverend Williams. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Thank you so much for the privilege of uh, having an opportunity to go to God on uh, our behalf. Uh, let us look to God. Father, we're thankful for your loving kindness, for your tender mercy, for all the wonderful and great ways that you've blessed us with so many great and incredible gifts, life, health, strength, families that love us. Thank you now for the privilege to serve. We lift up the members of this chamber, the families from which they come. Bless them, we pray, as they share the lives of their loved ones so that our community can be better. We give you praise and thanks for each of them, individually and respectively, in their places, with their own passion, their own desires to do good for the greater good. Help them now as we deliberate in this chamber, come to amenable and good solutions for the problems of our county. Thank you now, God, for their passion to serve. And oh Lord, we just pray that you continue to help us eradicate and remove this virus from among us. And as the chair has said, thank you now for the remembrance of even the dark moments in our history and in our lives. The dark places in our lives, they do have great value. Help us, we pray, never repeat those, and that armed with that powerful hand, we will be able to establish your justice in Pinellas County, the nation, and the world. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you, Reverend Williams. You're welcome. And have a wonderful day. And also you. Keep up the good work, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, um, and before I, we have one, just one uh, presentation today, um, and it's a special one, but uh, before we go there, I wanted to uh, uh, make everybody aware that uh, Commissioner Seal um, has had uh, some medical procedure and uh, it wants to participate here with us virtually today. And, uh, and if, if I've said anything not right, uh, Jewel, is there anything else that I need to add to that? We need to vote on allowing her to participate uh, and vote during, throughout the meeting. That's correct. I think that your comments are perfectly uh, uh, legitimate um, to address this issue. And yes, you would be voting to allow her to appear and participate virtually at the meeting. Move approval to allow Commissioner Seals to attend and vote 
virtually. Second. Okay, um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, I'm gonna step up to the, the podium there to uh, have a presentation. All right, I am really excited to have Ben Vargas uh, and, and Angel Barton um, to, uh, from Aero Matrix Composites. Uh, if they would come up, he, uh, Ben Vargas is the President and General Manager and Angel Barton is the Director of Human Resources. So they can come on up. It's good to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just stand right over here little bit so that people can see you. Okay, um, Aero Matrix Composites designs, engineers, fabricates, assembles interior and exterior composite products and solutions for customers in the aerospace and defense industry. And they've got a neat history and I'll let you share with that in a few minutes. Approximately 100 employees currently work for Aero Matrix. Now listen, people, listen, everybody out there, but they are hiring and would like to take this opportunity to encourage applications. So you can go to aeromatrixcomposites.com to apply. So that's a commercial and it's free. Um, but yeah, so please, uh, if you uh, get online, see the types of uh, jobs that they're looking to fill and please uh, check them out. That would be great. Um, the, the company is working, uh, and again, this is noteworthy, with Pinellas Technical College to create a new entry-level composite certification program to encourage applicants to learn more and join this growing industry. So you don't know what you don't know, and you can learn it pretty quickly. Uh, I, I met with St. Pete College this, just this past week, and they're talking about uh, rapid certification programs um, and how get folks, you know, schooled up quickly and get jobs that are paying in the 50s, 60s, and 70,000s pretty quickly. So I think these are great programs that we're, they're working to, to not only help our businesses that need employees, but to help employ uh, folks out there, residents who may be looking for a career change or they lost their job for one reason or another and have opportunities. So anyway, uh, Aeromatrix Roots and Pinellas stretches back to the 1980s when the company was known as Advanced Technology Research and pioneered interior aerostructure applications. Um, there was a purchase in there before I get to this one. In, in 2020, AAR Composites um, was acquired and is now Aeromatrix Composites. The company has seen substantial investment designed to fuel growth and recently added a new, whatever this is, you'll explain it, autoclave to the facility. Please join me in thanking Ben Vargas, President and General Manager, Angel Barton, Director of Human Resources, and their team for doing business in Pinellas County. And this is for you. There's the camera. We'll move that way just a little bit so we can get out from this. yours. Yeah. Good to have you. Uh, uh, Scott told them first that uh, as long as they kept the presentation under 20 minutes, we'd be okay. So, Scott, you're in trouble. I'm kidding. We know that, but uh, the microphone is yours. Okay. Good to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we're very proud and happy to be here today and thankful to be here. I uh, appreciate all the kind words and the support. Um, so, as, as Mr. Eggers mentioned, we've been around in business for uh, a better part of 30 plus years. So, uh, we've been doing a lot of the same things in the same building. So, a new name, we just celebrated one year as being Aeromatrix Composites under new ownership. So, that's been exciting for us. And the really exciting thing is that they want us uh, to grow. Uh, and they want to see that growth. They're investing in us. We've, we've purchased new equipment. Uh, we've brought jobs on and we're continuing to hire on. Uh, so hiring is one of our biggest uh, areas that we're focusing on today. 
Uh, and so we're really proud to be part of the uh, local economy in that sense and support job growth here. Um, so we're, we're also proud that we support a lot of the military platforms in the aerospace market with the defense customers as well as the commercial aerospace industry. Uh, we've done a lot over the years working with Scott Talcott and the Econ Economic Development Board. Uh, he's been awesome. The whole, the whole team over there has been really incredible to us. So they've linked us up with a lot of different programs that are offered in the county, and uh, it's really made a difference to our business, and we're very appreciative of all those efforts and, and the items that they have to offer. Uh, you know, teaming us up with Duke for energy audits, uh, getting us uh, the right contacts at the local, state, and uh, federal levels with the uh, government agencies uh, to just network and help us understand what's out there to help us be supported. So uh, we're always gracious and, and appreciative of that. So uh, Scott takes care of us. Um, also, a couple things. Uh, we've recently partnered with the National Aviation Academy, the NAA, uh, for an internship program. So we've got about 16 interns there uh, working about five days a week. So they're gaining a lot of experience as they're uh, getting their AMP licenses and going about their uh, uh, life ambitions. So uh, we're very proud of that. And then mentioned the, the Pinellas Technical uh, College helping us out as well. So. Uh, we've been around for a while. We, we intend to be around for a lot longer. So uh, with the support of Pinellas County, I think we can do that. So just want to say thank you. And uh, we're very proud and uh, thankful to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, sorry about that. I, I just really uh, was excited to learn about your business and, uh, and, what, and what you're bringing to Pinellas County. And I'm, I'm really glad you're partaking in some of the programs. Um, and um, and Angel, did you want to speak it to anything on the on the on the job front or? I think, I think Ben did a wonderful job. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's great. You can always visit. Oh, yeah, no, it's okay. All right, go so ahead. you can visit our website at aeromatrixcomposites.com, and all of our positions are listed. Um, and so we we are hiring, and it's very competitive. And to be in the aerospace industry is a very valuable job, and it's yeah. quite a technical position. And we train. So if you don't have any experience, that's okay. You can actually start, and we have a training program where we'll teach you everything you need to know. And so if anyone has any technical skills whatsoever or they're excited about an adventure in aerospace, they definitely should check out our website and then apply with me. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks again, you guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, all right. We have, um, looks like four folks that are going to speak under Citizens to be Heard. And... Um, in the house, I only have one, uh, David Ballard Geddes Jr. Come on up, David. Any no more? Okay. And then we'll have three that are attending online, Jeanette. So we'll go to you in just a minute. Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. David Ballard Geddes Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Based on county resolution and ordinance, Pinellas County has been sold to the Water District, seen as a fee simple 30 year title transfer in statute law. The current form of government is being dissolved in statute 15303, section seven and 11. As liquidated, the county is intending on shape shifting itself within itself using form-based code redevelopment as a third party to internally transfer and privatize city governments seen as a transfer of political function and power in Home Rule Charter Section 2.04Q. Using a quid pro quo agreement, the city redevelopment programs are intending on incorporating themselves within the water district privatized as individual independent 14th Amendment water jurisdictions as stemming from the Interlocal Cooperation Act of 1969 as recognized in Statute 163.01. And upon such political usurpation and insurrection of power, this faction is intending to use the reclaimed water variance application to claim eminent domain development rights privatized, imposed against civilian residentially owned property, levying the equity out of civilian owned homes to pay for the infrastructure that was neglected by the county, illegitimately claiming that they have the natural rights to do so 
as due process under the 14th Amendment as based on statute 15303, section five. I caution this proactive, pro-rogue government actively engaged in this political insurrection and usurpation that this political navigation is recognized as an actual invasion in Article I, Section 10, and in the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And such political insurrections seen as an invasion constitutionally shall not be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Jeanette, we'll go to you. I see we have three folks that are scheduled to be talking to us via Zoom. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, we do. Uh, the first individual is Mr. David Silman. Mr. Silman, if you would please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine so that we can unmute you to speak on this item. Once you are unmuted, please state and spell your name and state your address for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Go ahead, Dave. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Good morning, Commissioners. Dave Silman, S-I-L-L-M-A-N, 850 East Lime Street, Tarpon Springs. I'm here to talk about my favorite subject, Ready for 100, as you know, and inflection points. Um, I, I happened to catch the Commission work session last week, speaking of inflection points, and as you know, our Sunco Sierra Club thanks you for um, Started to consider this idea, um, and uh, uh, quite honestly, I am excited for you. This is an amazing opportunity. Uh, yes, this is a aspirational resolution. It is non-binding, um, and as such, there is really no downside here, but the upside is off the charts, truly. This is a desperately needed, incredibly important, broadly supported idea, and uh, the transition to clean energy uh, represents the, the greatest driver for economic growth, for job growth, for business opportunity, and all the associated uh, tax revenue that goes along with that. But um, so, so we applaud your, your leadership thus far, and I wanted to just put a finer point on this idea of this resolution and specifically how it relates to the new sustainability plan and, and Hank's great work there. Um, you know, this resolution is really simply and narrowly uh, recognition of the IPCC warnings and a setting of goals that align with the, the uh, scientific targets that have clearly been identified for emissions reductions in in order to avoid uh, the, the, the big inflection point, really, which we face, which is the irreversibility of all this climate damage we're doing right now. We really are at the doorstep of leaving our kids not only orders of magnitude worse climate disruption, but an irreversibility of it. Because basically, uh, you know, um, the, the Greenland ice sheet is at an inflection point, the West Antarctic ice sheet is at an inflection point. The lungs of the planet, the Amazon rainforests, are at an inflection point. Coral reefs around the world are at an inflection point. Biodiversity and species loss has us at an inflection point where ecosystems can unwind on us and get beyond our control to reel it back in. We're not there yet, but we're getting close. So this resolution simply recognizes that um, and, you know, uh, the, the great work that Hank is doing is about the how. This resolution is about the why. And uh, that's all. I appreciate uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you, David. Mr. Chair, the next individual registered to speak is Brooke Errett. Ms. Errett, if you would please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine so that we can unmute you to speak on this item. Once you're unmuted, please state and spell your name and state your address for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Please go ahead, Ms. Errett. Thank you very much. My name is Brooke Errett, last name spelled E-R-R-E-T-T. -T. I live at 10954 106th Way in Largo, Florida, 33773. I am a lifelong resident of Pinellas County um, and a lifelong carer of this beautiful county that we live in and the environment that we have here and preserving that for generations to come. And that's why I am happy to be here today to speak in favor of moving Pinellas County to 100% 
clean renewable energy sources as quickly as possible and moving away from the dangerous climate changing dirty fossil fuels that have put us into climate chaos. Um, as uh, Mr. Silman just mentioned, uh, the IPCC report that recently came out in August said we are in code red for humanity and living here on a peninsula off of a peninsula in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, we are at risk for some of the largest impacts from climate catastrophe, and that is why we must act quickly. Um, I do want to thank Commissioner Gerard for speaking out about this and wanting to push this through in Pinellas County because it is so incredibly necessary that we act and that we act now. Our neighbors right across the bay in the city of Tampa just passed a similar resolution in the beginning of August, moving the entire community to clean renewable energy by 2035. And um, additionally, calling on our federal officers to act on ending fossil fuel subsidies, ending fossil fuel extraction, and putting infrastructure into place to help counties and cities like ours to move forward and to move forward quickly. Uh, you know, a lot of times people say, well, those who want to go to clean energy can just do it when they want to. Uh, you know, I'm blessed that I was able to put solar on my home, but I have friends and neighbors who don't have that luxury and can only get to a 100% clean, renewable future from strong, bold action, like from leaders like yourselves. Uh, this is a social justice issue. Um, those who are our most vulnerable citizens, are the ones who are faced with the highest energy burden, uh, with bills that far surpass um, the bills that some of their wealthier neighbors have. Um, as a county commission, you can help to alleviate the energy burden to help all of our residents by committing the county to move. So thank you so much. We really look forward to working with you as this moves forward. Thank you, Brooke. Our last individual registered uh, to speak is Craig Murtha. Mr. Murtha, would you please raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine so that we can unmute you to speak on this item. Once you're unmuted, please state and spell your name and state your address for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Please go ahead, Craig. Mr. Chair, it appears Mr. or Craig has uh, dropped off of the Zoom call. Okay. And it may not be joining us. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jeanette. Oh. Did I hear somebody there? Or? Yes. Oh. Hi. Hello. This is Craig Martha, 145 Velma Drive in Largo, Florida. I was thinking the other day about the local history of Ready for 100, and I was thinking that, to my recollection, most of the leaders who supported Ready for 100 in the past also received the Sierra Club endorsements for their next election, and they were reelected. Some of them even ran unopposed, and I think they were unopposed because people who care about the environment didn't feel a burning need to oppose them. This is not to say that the Sierra Club support is going to swing an election. What I think it says is that leaders who are likely to partner with prestigious, respected, and altruistic organizations like the Sierra Club are also leaders who are sensitive to the wants and needs of their constituents. These leaders are loved in the community, and many of you are, lo are also loved in the community and for, for your hard work and your dedication to our county. As a commission, you have faced tough battles and made hard decisions. Compared to those battles and decisions, Ready for 100 should be an easy decision. It, it, it's the right thing to do, and I know that you know that in your heart. I feel like you've just been too busy with all the difficult, um, all the difficult battles that you've been facing to give Ready for 100 the time that it deserves. The problem is, though, that we are running out of time. Across the nation, visionary leaders understand the urgency, and they are stepping into the future by committing to 100% renewable energy. They might not know exactly how they're going to get there, but they know that renewable energy technology is advancing at an exponential rate and that and the technology is on their side. And the, the time is now for us to step up and show the world that we are visionary people with strong and bold leadership. I feel confident that we will meet this challenge. Thank you for using your experience, wisdom, excuse me, and wisdom to make Pinellas County a great place to live. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Okay, anybody, that was it, right? 
Jeanette, okay. All right, uh, we're moving on to the consent agenda, um, and uh, Commissioner Seal had uh, sent a note uh, just to make sure that uh, items 10 and 13 were pulled. Um, and then I, uh, as I usually do, go through and address briefly the items that are, uh, that are uh, involved dollars and cents contracts to it's clear what we're approving under the consent. So under administrative services, the approval of the ranking of firms uh, in a, uh, an agreement with John's Eastern Company, Inc. for workers' compensation third-party administration. Um, that is uh, a $1.236 million five-year contract, about 250000 a little bit less than that, uh, per year. Um, so that's item number eight under administrative services. Item nine, under human services, approve the rank, uh, ranking of firms and agreement with the Society of St. Paul, St. Vincent de Paul, South Pinellas, Inc., doing business as St. Vincent de Paul CARES for direct service provider for the rapid rehousing program under the Human Services Department. And that is an annual amount of about $600,000 and a five-year contract for $2.9 million. And then I'll skip over number 10 since that item is going to be pulled. Item 11 under solid waste, approval of an award of bid with Recycling Services of Florida for recycling collection and processing services for solid waste department. It's a contract in the amount of, of $1.68 million over five years or annually of $360,000. Under utilities, approval of award to XYLEM Water Solutions, USA, Mater Electric Motors, and Southeast Pump Specialists for lots of pumps, parts, repairs, and installation and calibration to the tune of $28.5 million over five years or $5.7 million per year. And item 13 is also being pulled, so I'll hold off on that. So with those descriptions and without Item 10 and 13, do I have a move, uh, a motion to move approval? Second. Commissioner Girard on the motion, Commissioner Flowers on the second, because I was looking this way and not that way. Sorry about that. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, 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 hold on. Sit. Stop the aye and the, and the nays. Commissioner Seal, did you have a question about the items under the consent other than your two? Commissioner Seal, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Okay, can you hear me now? I can, yes. Okay, for some reason the mute button didn't show up, so thank you staff for sending me a way to unmute it. <laughs> yeah. um, so my question on 10, and I had asked... Uh, uh, Commissioner Seal, hold on one second, okay? We had a motion for approval of the rest of the consent except 10 and 13. So okay. let, let me take action on that, and then we'll come to your item 10 and then item 13, okay? All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. And let's go to item 10. Sorry about that, Commissioner Seal. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this one had plans that were done by... Um, TBE back in 2008, and I'm sure that we delayed it because of the recession, but there's also um, a staff survey in 2016, and then we did a road safety audit in 2018, and I know, you know, we always, this has happened before where we can't use plans from that long ago, but nevertheless, I'm concerned about the scope and the possible construction budget that will probably well exceed $3.5 million. That's the current estimate. So I just kind of want to flag this one, that we need to be somewhat judicious in um, our approach to this particular road design. And so, hopefully be able to use the past plans, at least to some extent. Yeah. Um, so Commissioner Seal did send um, these, this question to us, and so Tom is available and he can answer uh, the questions and concerns. Hey, Tom okay, Washburn. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Yeah, welcome. Uh, Tom Washburn, Pinellas County Public Works Transportation. 
Uh, yes, Commissioner Seal, uh, in answer to your questions, uh, the consultant did receive that information as part of uh, the, the information when they were putting their proposal together. Um, so they are, they did incorporate the recommendations from the road safety audit and to the extent possible, they will be using the available survey. Obviously that'll have to be updated to reflect the current conditions. Uh, the current budget that we have set aside right now for construction is about 4.9 million. So we did increase that uh, during this last cycle. Uh, the scope of the project takes us, it's a preliminary engineering report and it takes us up to 30%, which allows us to collect all the data that we need, evaluate the alternatives, settle on an alternative and take that to the public, um, gets us to about 30% design plans. And then once we're settled on that, we can go from there. And that's about two years away when we'll have that complete. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? About two years? Go ahead. You said about two years, Tom? Yes, this PER study is, is uh, just under two years in duration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and then, it, Tom, while I have you here, um, it, it's $848,000 for this set of plans that we're talking about. Correct. And the 134000 for five SBEs, I mean, they apparently use five SBEs in their bid. Correct. Yes. Totaling about 16% of the contract. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good thing. And um, this project continues to go through the, the, the ranking that you guys go through for prioritization, I'm assuming. Of course. So yes. it gets re it gets looked at every year as it, as it and it gets placed in in in, in the uh, pipeline. At, I'm assuming at some point. It um, will, and yeah. it has gone through that process, and that's that's how it's made it onto the CIP. I believe this is also a Penny Four promised project. Right. And that's why it's it's yeah. rated where it is. And, yes, and that, that was going to be my next question. It was a, a lot of the promised project so yeah, yeah and they're they're ranking a lot of those and they have to get the preliminary engine out because some of the, the the construction figures that were originally done were back you know prior to 2017 and so um, they need to get some of the preliminary and so they're putting money into the capital uh, to be able to do these preliminary engineering reports that way we can firm up construction cost estimates you know for e years two three and four so today on item on item 10 we are approving eight hundred and forty eight thousand five hundred and seventy five dollar contract to um pannoni pannoni associates for engineering services correct okay i have a motion for approval please motion for approval by commissioner peters second by commissioner gerard all in favor say aye aye any opposed Motion carries unanimous. And on to item 13, Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, I just um, still have objections about this particular um, item, even though I'm thankful for the further explanation that we got, but I just wanted the opportunity to be able to vote no. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and this is a, a an approval of a bid to Presidio Holdings as requested by Business Technology Services for Cisco Equipment Software Maintenance. And we had a workshop on Thursday a week ago, more, yeah, a week ago, and where we had a lot more in-depth discussion about what this was all about. Does anybody need to have that? Yeah, Commissioner Long, you had a question. Well, I, I think for the record, it would be good for Commissioner Seal, if you don't mind, Commissioner, to just reiterate, are you still in that mindset of objection even after hearing what, or I'm assuming that you heard what Jeff Roars spoke to as the need for this particular equipment? I did. I was, you know, present and listened during the work session. Um, I just still think that um, it, the price tag is very high for all of the um, I mean, it's a huge amount of money. So um, I just, like I said, wanted the opportunity to be able to vote no. Okay. And um, I know Jeff is here, so um, maybe you could work your way up here just for a question or two if there's, there is any. Um, so this $12.7 million, or excuse me, five-year total of $24,500,000 is spread out 
over the, in individual years, depending on the need that we've addressed? And do you see it all being expended during that five years? And maybe you could just briefly, as residents might be listening in, speak to the rationale behind this contract and why BTS and the board is recommending this. Sure. So, you know, as I mentioned before, Cisco is a... You're going to really have to speak up, John. ...is a very foundational partner with uh, Pinellas County. And, you know, really uh, most of our IT systems rely on Cisco. Um, every five years, we have an opportunity to bid out for a new partner. Uh, this particular uh, award here would be a new partner over the previous five years. Um, the last five years was at 11.8 million in total, and this is 24. To speak to you, it, it, it is five years, and that's our best um, uh, estimates of a total spend over that five-year period. So it's got to put us in the best position to take the county into the future. Uh, 4.2 is, if you look at the staff memo, 4.2 million of that is for what we call operating and maintenance. That's just the support contract that we have every year. Um, in addition to that, we have another roughly 11 million in new purchases um, in network and server, which is the core of the, uh, the county's IT infrastructure. The, the county's what? I'm sorry. Core IT infrastructure. So really the new items, which I showed in the workshop, are, are this idea of we do have to replace our telephone system. It's, uh, it was planned for at 10 years. It's now going to be, it's 11. And by the time we implement and do this refresh, it'll be next year, which will be 12 years. So a couple years past our target of 10 years. Um, uh, Jeff, on, on that one, I'm sorry. Um, maybe you could explain, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know how old my phones are at home, but for the for all of us, a, mm -hmm. a, a ten year, ten or eleven year old phone it sounds old, but yeah. tell me why it's important that we do that. Well, so we're at a we're at a decision point right now. Our phones are are um, coming up on the end of their supported lifespan. So, and we have six thousand of them, and each of these phones is, is is a couple hundred dollars minimum. If you do the math on that, that's a lot of dollars. Uh, what we didn't want to do is go out and buy the same type of phone system we have today. So we're in the middle of gathering requirements and doing um, architectural assessments and engineering assessments on what the future telephone system is going to be, because it's not going to look like our telephone system today with all of the standard instruments on everyone's desks. People have adopted new ways of communicating. Obviously, we want to communicate on our cell phones. and. Uh, have a seamless communication experience. So the next generation of our phone system will look completely different, but it doesn't change the fact that our current phone system is at its end of functional lifetime, and we do have to replace it. Uh, we've built that into this contract, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that we will spend these dollars. That's still the to be determined on which direction we go and how much goes to Cisco. Okay, so, so we, we have to replace it, you said. Absolutely. And, and I need to know why we have to replace it. What does functionally obsolete mean? So the vendor is no longer going to support those or provide security patches. They're going to become actually vulnerable to security attacks very soon because we won't get patches anymore. Plus, we can't call the vendor for any support or help if there's ever a problem with our phone system. So it's literally not supported anymore. So that's okay. the that's the point we were we were prepared for. We knew this coming into it that at ten years we wanted to replace it. So, okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. As on. as a, one of the board members that sits on BTS, I I find sometimes it's really difficult if you're not in those meetings to comprehend the the largesse of the system that we have. And I remember when I very first came on. BTS, it was like learning a new language to listen to the technology speak that went on, especially when Commissioner Welch was with us because we all knew, know he was our technology guru on the board. But all that to say that during the transition between uh, Jeff's predecessor and him, it was an enormous learning curve for me, especially because technology is not my level of expertise by any means. But what I was struck by when we started hearing about these dollars that we were looking at down the road 
was because we are living in a different world today than we have been in the past. And the cyber threats that we are opening ourselves up to by not preparing to uh, take advantage of the latest and greatest of technologies that are coming on board is one of our greatest weaknesses. And the, what really brought that home to me was when I went to meet with the CEO of Knology, who is a big, very successful high-tech firm right here located in Pinellas County. And it was really um, eye-opening and mind-altering to hear him tell me one of the reasons that they had a difficult time working with government was because government, by virtue of the way we do our contracts, cannot be nimble enough to keep up with the threats that we are constantly facing. And when we had um, our shade meeting on this subject matter, I don't remember who of all of you were there during that or not, but that was really almost frightening to hear about what we were uh, open to, to being on the receiving end of. So all of these things that Jeff talks to us about, we have had very long and robust conversations about on the BTS board level with, by the way, all of the constitutionals who have totally supported the efforts that Jeff has been working on and have given him great accolades for the way in which he has lined everything up for us. Yeah, and, and, and I Thank do, you. and I appreciate the, the, the commissioners that are on that BTS board, and I also appreciate the constitutionals that are on there. And for some of us, um, we're not, so, <laughs> and, and the residents that are watching are not. So you, you're, you're about $15 million into your 24 million. You've talked about 4.2 million, and then 11 million. So could you just summarize the remaining Bit and so, then. so the next large piece is that 5.3 million, which is uh, for the anticipated phone expense, uh, not only for the purchase and the refresh, but the five years of owner and operating uh, ownership and operating of that system over the next five years, and that's 5.3. Uh, the remaining two pieces uh, may or may not be spent. Um, we've built into this contract, unlike the previous contract, a 3.3 million dollar training and professional services um, a bucket. That would be only used if we needed and had the need to augment our staff or uh, engage in some professional services to help in a way. And that would be funded obviously through our budget, through um, whatever mechanisms. But at this point, that's really just a safety net. It's there in case we need it. but. We don't even know if we're going to spend that portion of this. And the last piece is the 300,000 of unexpected or unanticipated requests. Um, so that's really the total. The, the last thing I would like to mention is, you know, this is a larger contract, but every five years we'd get this opportunity to set ourselves up in the best position for the next five. And this contract has over a 10% deeper discount than the previous contract did on the equipment we're gonna buy and in some cases, e even more than 10% better than the previous five-year contract. So as these contracts get larger, they also get more cost-effective. So we're actually saving uh, quite a bit more on this contract. Our previous contract, for example, was 43% off uh, ma manufacturer-suggested retail price, and this is 52 to 66% off, so pretty substantial differences there. Uh, and, and I have full confidence that you're getting the best deal that we can get. That's, yeah. that's really reassuring. It's still a lot you're taking out of the wallet. Mm -hmm. um, even though it is a discount, I'd hate to yeah. do the math and see what it would have been. But that, that appreciate your going through that. I think it's really important that not only us here, but the residents understand kind of the makeup of that 24 million, because it is a lot of money. Absolutely. Um, and it's an area that we, a lot of us don't know a lot about. So did you have anything, Barry? I'm sorry. No. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Flowers. I don't have a question, just want to um, expound because you are correct, Mr. Chairman, sometimes when persons are viewing us um, and if they're not um, really um, looking to kind of further their thought process in this area, 
it can be a little daunting. But um, for those who are watching, uh, a number of people probably think back to the trunk system, where for a telephone system we had within a closet <laughs> this device that could hold X amount of data and X amount of numbers. And once you ran out of that, you were out of gas, or you had to purchase additional routers for that trunk system. Over the years, we have grown such that we're not all under one roof. We're throughout the county. And so this phone system will not only allow us to grow as we grow, and I think we'll probably see more remote working as time goes on, but it also helps us in the areas of security within our systems. Um, we've all seen on a number of occasions where larger organizations have unfortunately been invaded by persons who are less than positive actors. And they can utilize that system in order to access other parts of our system to gain personal information or data. And then we, as an organization, could potentially be held hostage, if you will, like some others, um, for the release of that data in order for us to continue our operations. A lot of that conversation took place and um, really becomes concerning for me when we look at our court system, we look at our property appraiser and tax appraiser's office, because those are the ones that house a lot of data that could be turned around um, and utilized in other ways. So um, I just kind of wanted to share that maybe for anyone who was watching and probably did not understand the difference between the phone systems that we utilize now, especially going into the cloud or this new system, which is beyond the cloud. I'm still learning about that one. It is even beyond the cloud being able to access um, envelopes or folders within space that you could put certain data but be able to retrieve that data and only those who have access to those folders could retrieve that data versus what we are accustomed to, which is the old uh, phone yeah. system that makes it a little bit harder. So I don't know if that yeah. oh, helps any, but um, but I, I, it was a lot of numbers. They were big numbers for everybody. Um, but we, I think, came to a consensus within the BTS meeting as Commissioner Long stated that for the growth and development of a, our organization and to look beyond not just purchase something where it'll help us for like the next one or two years, but to go beyond so that we're not having to come back and forth was kind of where we wanted to focus. So, thank you, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Commissioner Long, for your comments. Um, functionally obsolete, what do you see the next generation being? When do you, when's this going to be functionally? It wouldn't, you know, when are you looking at that? E easily 10 years, you, you pretty much can anticipate like a 10 year life for that style of, of, of equipment. Um, you know, other things are seven, some are five, but this has been that 10 year category. Okay. okay, thank you for taking the time to answer our questions and maybe really speak to our residents a little more, so. Okay, uh, any final questions? And do I have a motion, please? Commissioner Flowers on the motion, Commissioner Peters on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. The, the vote carries uh, six to one. Okay. Okay, now we're going to move on to our regular agenda. And uh, first up will be the under county administrator departments, the county administrator. Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners. We have four municipal taxing unit um, um, requests for funds. The first one up is Tierra Verde Community Association for repair of their playground equipment in the amount of $25,075. Um, second. Motion by Commissioner Justice and second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, I, I'm listening, waiting for you, Commissioner C. I just want to make sure I. And I want to clarify, it's twenty thousand dollars. The total amount is twenty-five. So, okay. I you Thank said you. okay. Yeah. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item fifteen. The second um, item is a municipal taxing um, uh, unit funding for Palm Harbor Historic Society to construct a native plant and historic living landscape with interpretive sign in the amount of twenty thousand dollars. Commissioner Justice on the motion, Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 16. 
This is another uh, municipal taxing unit funded uh, for funding for Palm Harbor Chamber of Commerce, downtown Palm Harbor, Harbor beautification uh, streetscape program. So this adds to all the great work that's been done with the downtown uh, um, Palm Harbor area with the master plan, with the form-based code um, and revitalization efforts. Motion by Commissioner Flowers and second by Commissioner Justice. <coughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item four, 17. Uh, and this is the last municipal taxing unit uh, funding for P Pinellas Police Athletic League video surveillance equipment for the Lelman Sports Complex for both of their locations. Commissioner Justice on the motion, Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, and I really just wanted to thank the uh, assistant to the county administrators uh, uh, for bringing these. Uh, they're really connecting with their, their communities that they represent and bringing important work for us to consider. And I really appreciate the efforts. Um, and uh, I think they're all even here today. So, they're all back yeah, there. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> good, to, good to have you all in the house. Go ahead, Barry. Under human services, item 18. This is an agreement with the District 6 medical examiner, um, and this is for their office and the forensic laboratory in the amount of just over $6.7 million. Okay. Yeah, and I see Dr. Thogmark in, in the house. Did you want to come forward? Any comments or just... Are you sure? Unless you want me to. Oh, yeah, come on. We just want to be here a little bit. He just wants us checked. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I know. But there's a, there, there's, a, there's a lot going on out there, and he might just want to touch on a couple of things. And Welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah, I just want to make sure the agenda item didn't blow up. That's why I'm here. <laughs> um, no, everything's pretty good. We're busy. A lot of fentanyl and yeah. stuff. Um, the lab's doing really well. They got a big award. And then... Um, they or we? Well, we, the lab. Okay. I always give credit to Rita where credit's due. <laughs> right. I got it. Um, the only other thing, I, I think um, if you're wondering about COVID, how it's going there, um, you're getting younger. I'm seeing younger people. In fact, um, I got a gift from my high school. My high school junior brought COVID to my house and gave it to me. So I've been over it for about, I guess, uh, it's been about eight days since I cleared out. But, you know, so it wasn't a big deal. But I was vaccinated, so probably got the Delta, broke through. But I was careful. But what's funny is, um, you know, COVID is really odd. You know, it's getting, like I said, it's getting younger. I'm not, you know, in the, back in the days when it first came, we we're getting like pretty old people, old, sick, right? And most of those people are pretty wise. They're getting, they're getting the shot. So I'm not seeing, I'm still seeing some old people, but not as many. Now I'm getting like 42 year olds, 51 year olds, no history. And I think the reason is um, it's kind of interesting. I've done a lot of reading about it. I had like 10 days of sitting around doing nothing <laughs> to read, and so I did. And um, it's pretty interesting. It reproduces faster, gets in the cells quicker. So it's able to do in four days what the original COVID could do in six. So it's able to get like a two day jump. And uh, I've been very careful with my surveillance when we have cases and, uh, you know, I've had, you know, personally, I've had a couple of pretty young, like a 42 year old woman with no history. looks like she's going to be a COVID unexpectedly 51 year old had just certified that out. So we're getting younger people. So there's some concern. Most are unvaccinated. And, um, but for me, it was like a day and a half of mild fever and I'd say a moderate cold and yeah. Pretty pretty wimpy overall. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. We're glad. Yeah, we're no. glad. I would say that if um, of my friends, I mean, I'm not, I don't ever tell anybody what to do, but um, you you wouldn't want. I think that if you're vulnerable, Delta is a lot more dangerous or appears. Whatever it is out there right now, the CDC says it's Delta. So whatever's out there right now is based upon what I see, and it's a limited sample. It appears to be a little bit more dangerous, yeah. just a little. Yeah. Any questions for Dr. Thogmartin? Yes, Commissioner Peters. Yeah, I want to hear about this award. What award was it that y'all got? 
What's that? The award. I want to hear about the award. Oh, it's like a prestige award or something. I should have brought the paper so I could hold it up. Yay, Rita's going to kill me. She's going to kill me. But I just remember that. Yeah. But she didn't come today. But yeah, it was a really big award. I think about maybe 10, 15 labs. She got it because they're just so good. Yeah, they are really good. You got yeah. great staff over there and oh, a great yeah. team. And you all have been overworked for the last year and a half. And on the fentanyl and the COVID, and I just can't even imagine what it's like over there, but you've done an outstanding job, so thank you. We do what we can. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, Commissioner Long. How are, you, how are you doing, Dr. Thog Martin, with staffing? Well, it's, um, it's funny. It's just like Walmart, you know? Um, Walmart, you know, you talk to the people at Walmart. I do occasionally talk to actual living human beings when you see them face to face, right? <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> they're having trouble hiring people. I am too. I'm having trouble too. I've got a records vacancy trying to get people and it's hard to get applicants. They come, you know, they're just, just you can't get people. It's weird. And then I have a, uh, I'm looking for a doctor and uh, I hate to say it, but I think my idea of what the salary should be may be not quite as competitive. So I may have to dig a little harder. Uh, overall, um, we're pretty, staffing is kind of tough for some of the harder to fill positions trying to find the right person, but I don't think we're alone in that at all from, yeah. you know, I went to one of my favorite restaurants, I won't drop the name, but uh, they give me this limited menu. This is about a month and a half ago. They can't even serve a full menu because we just can't get the people. I'm hoping that ends soon, but it's really weird. Yeah. I mean, I went to Burger King, they can't get ice cream, so <laughs> weird. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so much need out there for, for employees and um, people looking for work. I'm just not sure how the – there's a lot of disconnect, and I'm not quite sure I understand all of it. But I know some of it's skill sets and, some, you know, whatever, but it's just – it is weird. It's, uh, it's strange. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't try to – it's beyond – it's outside my pie, outside <laughs> of my realm of expertise, so I just shrug and say I hope it gets better. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you again for okay. being here, and um, congratulations on the, uh, the award. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, did we do a motion on this? Thank you. Yeah. Second. Yeah, we did have a motion. Yeah, already. Sorry. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is that, a, um, is that an aye? From, okay. Uh, any, Would you repeat the motion as far as who was the first and second, please? Um, well, I, I, I didn't actually even remember that we had done one. My trusted vice chair over here said we did do one. So do you remember, Charlie, who did the motion originally? All right. So let's just say Commissioner Peters is doing the motion. Second. And Commissioner Gerard is doing the second, regardless of whether we did one before or not. This is the official one. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All Thank right, you. moving on to item 19. This is a funding agreement with Gulf Coast uh, Legal Services for legal aid services. Um, the majority of this comes out of court collected fees. There's some general fund also. Motion by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Gerard. Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 20. There's a grant award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration for our assisted outpatient treatment services for individuals with serious mental illness. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Long. Any questions or comments? Okay. All in favor say aye. Any, oppo aye. any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 21. This is our um, annual Human Services Social Action Funding Grant recommendations. Uh, it's outlined in your packet. Total amount not to exceed $1.5 million. Okay, any questions? We did talk a little bit about this at the workshop. Um, is there anybody that would like to bring it forward for additional dialogue? Um, I don't, um, you, you went through a bidding process on this. Maybe maybe you could come up. Um, maybe, uh, who yeah, I'll, I'll ask Karen to come up. We, so we go, it's a competitive process. We outlined in, in, a, in a response that we had some questions for regarding the makeup of the committee for both the small and the large issues. One of the other issues that was raised, has been raised about um, beds, it's really not an issue under our social action funding. It's really an issue about a contract that was issued back in January 
um, and so staff's evaluating that, and so they're going to they're going to look at the effectiveness of that decision. It really doesn't impact our social action funding piece. Hi, good afternoon, Karen Yatcham, director with Human Services. Hi, Karen. Um, so for social action funding, yes, this process is competitive. So we did have rank and review. We had a small group with community um, stakeholders that judged the groups from 10 to 99,000, and then another group that reviewed the um, larger projects um, up to 150. Thank you. Any uh, any questions? Okay. Um, and before you sit down, I just wanted to thank you um, for helping out this weekend when somebody had called me and needed some help. They were. I guess they lost their home because mm -hmm. of an accident uh, that actually killed uh, one of the occupants of the house and um, they were without a home. So mm -hmm. they called and I reached out to you guys and you went into action, got 211 involved and mm -hmm. I just really want to say thank you for that right on the, right on the fly um, and just helping some folks out in that short term. Um, I don't know, I think they were going to get them someplace at least through Wednesday or something like that and then try to find them some additional Sure, and I can really thank Mickey with Two on One. She really was such a great partner through that process. I called her on the weekend. Uh, we worked together to secure a hotel for that family, and then she personally delivered a gift card for food. Um, we have held a community staffing, and that family is connected to ongoing services. Well, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, lose a family member and then lose your home, it's just a terrible time, and it's confusing, emotional, and it was nice to have somebody there for them. So thank great. you. Thank you. Um, okay, move approval from Commissioner Justice, from Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion cover, uh, passes unanimously. Item 22 under Parks and Conservation. This is an agreement with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office for um, law enforcement for our environmental lands deputies. Motion by Commissioner Long and a second by Commissioner Justice. Any questions on this one? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. On to safety and emergency services, item 23. Um, this is a Medicaid emergency medical transport uh, letter of agreement between Pinellas County Emergency Medical Services, a Sunstar, and the Agency for Healthcare that allows us to participate in the state Medicaid public emergency transportation intergovernmental transfer program. Okay. Any questions? I have a motion. Motion by Commissioner Gerard. Second. Second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Now, under solid waste. Uh, item, item 24, 24 is our annual cert certificate for the Lowman Solid Waste Collection and Disposal District, the non ad valorem assessment roll. This um, provides a $16 or per month through um, December 31st, 2022. Commissioner Justice on the motion, Commissioner Long on the second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now under utilities, item 25. This is a First Amendment in agreement with PCL Construction for design build services at the Dunn Water Reclamation uh, Filtration um, Facility. Uh, this in essence moves us to phase two, which is a construction phase of this design build contract. Okay. Any questions on the Phase two amount of eleven million nine hundred thousand dollars. Nope. Do I have a motion? Second. Commissioner uh, Justice on the motion. Commissioner Flowers on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Yeah. Any opposed? Well, Mr. Chair. Yes. Just for clarification, you mentioned eleven million, but I'm reading here thirteen million. That's the total total contract amount. So yeah. it's a design build, so it was all bid together, and but you do it in phases, the design and then the build, but it was all one contract. Okay, just. Okay, yeah, thank you for that clarification. I thought we were only dealing with phase two, but I guess we're dealing with both? Well, you're dealing with both. You already approved phase one. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. So yeah. we are just approving the 11-9 today. Okay. 
So uh, I think I said all in favor, uh, say aye, please. Aye. <laughs> Karen? Yeah, I said aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now moving on to authorities, boards, constitutional okay. officers, and councils under Economic Development Authority, item 26. This is the third amendment to the memorandum of understanding with uh, Star Tech um, for the Pinellas County Industrial Development Authority or our Economic Development Authority for our incubator. Uh, this allows us to uh, have a, a memorandum of understanding with them to where they can go out and raise funds um, and proceed towards what will eventually be an operating agreement between, be with us for the new incubator. Yeah, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, I've had a number of conversations with Barry as well as with the team um, for this incubator. Um, and I guess um, there were concerns with timelines even before I became a um, commissioner. Um, but I, I just wanted to say for the record that I shared my concerns and, and remain very concerned mm -hmm. about um, the commission being given updates that the group is going to do this, they're going to do this, they're going to raise the funds. I understand that they've located someone who's supposed to have some pretty deep pockets and whatnot, but um, at some point they've got to just move forward and dig some dirt and move on. And if not, then we just need to decide, are we going to stay on this or are we going to get off of, off of it? Um, so I've made that very clear when I had a conversation with the attorney, uh, mm -hmm. with the group as well as staff. Um, I did offer to um, provide or set up or arrange a uh, community conversation piece because I've received a number of calls from people within the community that live around where the incubator will be as to whether or not they even kn knew about it, what's going on, how will it assist small and minority businesses. Um, there's an education component piece now with the Pinellas Education Foundation, which I don't have an issue of concern with, but when you're thinking about incubator, I'm thinking more business, not necessarily lower education. Um, so they agreed um, to, to have that, which the date that we've decided on is October uh, 28th, and I'll keep everybody more informed if you um, have a desire to come, but really it's an opportunity for them to share what it is that they're doing, how far they are, what type of support um, they are seeking from the community, and whether or not what they want to do even fits in with people in that community that would be a part of it. Thank you for asking them to come up because that was going to be my next thing. Right. So everything, anything that I'm saying here is nothing that I haven't said to them and their staff. I've had a more than one conversation, um, but at some point, you know, we've got to just either move on with this or not. I appreciate the fact that they now have a person who is fundraising, but I was told that when I first became a commissioner that they were getting a person. And I think now the person just started a few days before I had my last conversation with them. So we've got to stop dragging our feet on this. Um, and we've just got to move forward. So again, I've shared that with their staff and with the attorney that was on the line. And um, Mr. Kevin Knutson was also on the call as well. Yeah. So I'm just sharing my yeah. concerns, well, my yeah. feelings. Yeah, I think, I think your, your concerns have been raised over time, actually. Uh, so you're, you know, it's, it's spot on. I mean, we, we've been talking about this for some time. Um, the, the, the vision of what this was a, supposed to be about or what it is supposed to be about is, is exciting. It's really, it's, 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 it's really leading edge stuff. But I think, you know, we need to have a better open discussion about, about it. So again, to the, to, to the community that's in the area, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. I mean, just physically, forget the vision about what we're trying to do here, but just having that communication. But, uh, you know, Kevin, I, I, I had that conversation with you all this week, too, and um, I have also been a little bit concerned about that we will be, we will be, but there seems to be, and again, I, I cautioned that October is really close and getting lease agreements and getting contracts and getting all of that done is like should have been done three or four months ago to get done next month. But I, you know, we'll see how that works out. But maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's going on and the the the, the thirty thousand foot view of of the program and what where we're heading, what it's all about, and then maybe some of those roadblocks that we've experienced that seem to be opening up. And, and, and for the record, Kevin was wonderful, so I don't want yeah. him to think that what I just said had anything to do with you. You were just on the call, yeah. you know, as staff. So yeah. I. Yeah. 
well, want to clear and, that up. <laughs> and absolutely, uh, staff has shared those concerns all along. And, and in fact, if I can give you a little bit of history that I've learned uh, since I've been here. When we first went out to get the, um, the grant from the EDA was in uh, 2019. And the estimate on the cost of the building at that time was $12 million. They awarded us $7.5 million, a little bit less than that. And our matching responsibility, which we agreed to, was $4.5 million at that time. Of course, then the pandemic happened. That was awarded in July of 2019. Of course, the pandemic happened, slowed things down, and we really didn't get to the point where we were looking at a design until earlier this year. So in May of this year, what we learned was it's likely to cost around $14 million. And so uh, the county administrator and I met with the group and asked them to raise that additional $2 million, which is in this MOU. That's one of the purposes of the MOU is to memorialize that request um, in order for us to close that gap. And so what we're doing at this point is we're, we're kind of in a chicken and egg situation. We're gonna get the uh, cost of the building very soon. It's out for bid right now. We have not committed to building it yet. That will happen next. And at the same time, we're looking for that $2 million that they're gonna raise to, to close that gap. And so that announcement is expected in October and our award of the bid could then happen at that time because they will have fulfilled the need that we had to, to make sure that the funds were there. So, and, so what are we talking about? So people can understand a little bit what this is all about. This, this the, the incubator itself? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the idea of the incubator is it's a space where we can invite different growing companies, people who are starting new technologies, people who have ideas that they want to turn into businesses, to come and get support in learning how to put a business together, to actually have office space and laboratory space where they can do their work and create the products that they want to sell. Um, at this point, we're looking at some very high-tech type um, uh, industries in uh, um, AI, whatever that stands for. I'm Artificial totally drawn. Thank you. I drew a blank there for a second. <laughs> okay. um, AI, database management, cybersecurity, things around the software and hardware industry that, that are, is growing and could be a real benefit for the community because that's something that we're seeing as a growth opportunity over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, like I said, it'll bring people in who are growing businesses. So we'll have people from the Small Business Development Corporation there who can do consulting for them, help them find financing, help them do marketing, all the different things that you need to learn to do business. Because a lot of these people are really technically expert in what they're doing. They know how to build the thing, but they don't necessarily know how to sell it, how to bring it to market. And so this organization will create an opportunity for those folks to do that. Um, and at the same time, allow us to bring a new breadth of innovation into the community. So there's new things gonna happen. Um, there's a potential that we're gonna be able to do some uh, K through 12 kind of training for innovation in the schools. Um, a lot of exciting things could happen around this. We need these two pieces to come together though, obviously. We need the funding and then we need to uh, actually award the contract. And, and what we talked about is not only, um, and again, I probably got in, I, I got into too many numbers when we were having our conversation only because well there is a initial capital cost that we're coming up with then there's an operating cost for the, for the building and so that has to be carried by somebody yes. it presumably ideally is carried by all the rent payers that that come into that building that it's, is a, it's supposed to be a 45,000 square foot building so there'll be a 6,000 foot tenant on the on, on one floor there's going to be multiple tenants on a, another part of the building, there's gonna be some retail space at market rates, which in, in that area are pretty high. And presumably all of that would take care of the operating cost in, the, in, the, in that yes. next two to three years. So between now and then, there are some gaps perhaps in on, on covering the operating costs. And um, you were telling me where that comes from. Um, yes. So. so to be clear, the EDA grant requires us to be self-sustaining at some point. It doesn't, not from day one, but at some point. Yeah. And the performance we did show that that can happen at around 65% capacity. So it's actually going to be able to generate more money than it needs to operate once it's up and running. And what we've done is we've created a, a landing path for them by using funding that's already coming out of the Star Center for Star Tech. We're going to continue that, but it's going to drop down each year until they're fully self-supporting after probably two to three years. So so there will be, that, that funding will come from our Star Center. That is correct. Uh, operating system, uh, it's office buildings, uh, warehouse spaces, tenants that are there that are generating rents will help offset the interim period on operating cost shortfalls. That is correct. Okay, so no property tax revenues, that general tax fund revenues for this project. Yes, Commissioner Long, sorry. Um. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, 
So I, I am curious, as someone who used to raise money for a living, 11 years worth of it, um, as long as we have been working on this, I just want to make sure I'm looking at this properly. Is this telling me that only two potential funders have been secured? At this date, yes. Um, one of the issues has been, since we weren't sure when we were moving forward, it was difficult for um, StarTech to actually go out to the community. We didn't have any drawings. We just had an idea, and so there wasn't really any good uh, lever to pull for fundraising. Now that we've got a design underway and we've got all of that in place, they're now going out to the community and really engaging them. And I think that if, if they're able to close the deal that uh, we're sharing with you in, in private conversations, um, that's going to be a catalyst for other people to come to the table. It's going to be an opportunity to join into something really great. So uh, we feel that, a as it's been presented to us, that this is a really good opportunity. Do you know if they have developed a strategic plan to move this agenda forward? In other words, who's their target market? That is in development. And along the same lines, uh, Commissioner Eggers mentioned about the, the contract for operating it. That will be in development as well. Our agreement with the EDA is that we have to have it in place before the certificate of occupancy, which is going to be sometime in the spring or early summer of 2023. So we have a little bit of time before we're actually operating to get those things in place. Yeah, but you've already been working on it for quite some time, is to Commissioner Flower's point. And I guess my biggest concern here is have you identified who the, pers who the point person is going to be that makes the ask? I don't see any profiling in here at all. I would think that before they even started down that road, they would have done some very preliminary things to ensure that at some point they're ready to hit the ground running. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, it does, yes. Um, and actually, uh, Ms. Elmore from StarTech is here and could probably speak oh, to I, their fundraising. I know, I know okay. her very well. I, I don't know the details about how we they're doing the fundraising. We have worked before so. in another chapter of our lives, hers okay. and mine. Well, I, I'm just saying that this is um, a little all over the place. It doesn't give us a, it's, I'm looking at this 3395 is that the proposed cost? or the proposed amount that you want to raise? That's the amount that they need to raise. Two million is for the actual building itself and then an additional 1.5 million for the fixtures and equipment that are gonna go into the facility, which they will own. So that money won't come to us, they'll actually buy things. And when them. was this, uh, when was all, how long ago was this done? I mean, those dollars a few years ago are already probably doubled by now. Well, exactly, and that, that was the issue that we were dealing with back in May when we found out that there was going to be a lot more costs. So this MOU has been in place for a couple of years. This will be the third amendment. And the idea of this MOU is just to create the relationship between us to move forward on this project. Obviously, we still have to build the project. We still have to have an operating agreement and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this encapsulates that idea that they're going to raise the $2 million. Yeah. It continues the idea that they're going to supply the FF&E, which is about $1.5 million. And at the end of the day, we're not going to award the bid until we're sure that this is done. So we're not going to move forward with construction until we've gotten to the point where we know that we've got the funds to build it. And so this is just the bridge to get us there. If uh, if they can't raise the funds, well, then we'll make that well, decision before we initiate the contract, which will come back to you. I cannot support this today. I'm very sorry to say. We have been talking about it for quite some time. But I know from the work I have done in, in my past life that you have got to have a plan, and it has to be strategic. And it all really is predicated on five principles, that if you don't have them laid out, you will not be successful. And I am, have been a great supporter of Star Trek tech or whatever we're calling it today. Um, but, you know, at some point, I think there's got to be more meat on the bone 
for us to keep on extending, extending, and extending. So unless I'm missing something, and I'm certainly, you know, open to learning more, but. Well, can I reframe it just a little bit? Please, um, give me a reason to. All, all those things that you're talking about are the next steps. What this does is allows us to continue the relationship that we already have with them, but we still need to go through the process of getting the, the funding from them and making sure that that happens, making sure that we've got everything in place before we go and put a shovel in the ground and create the building itself, and all the planning that's gonna go into the strategic plan, into the operating lease, and all of that still has to happen. But we need this framework to do that. If we don't have a relationship with them, then it kind of falls apart at that no, point. No, I understand that. But Tanya, how long ago was that you sat in my office and we started talking about this? I mean. Uh, are we going to be here five years from now and we're still talking about putting a plan in place? I would what? have thought between then and now that would have been at least you'd have more than this to show for it. Well, Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. You know I'm really a friend. <laughs> I know you are. And I appreciate the comments. Actually, we do have a strategic plan. Um, the fundraising was brought to our attention. We have always agreed that we would raise the 1.5 once we get closer. Excuse to me, the 1.5 for, for furniture, For the furniture and equipment. And, and, equipment. and then when the cost came out higher, we as our board agreed to raise another $2 million on top of that back for the county to support the project. So, and that just came up in May, June. And so here we are finalizing the legal agreements, hopefully for an announcement in October for that $2 million that we promised to give back to the county. So it's not anything that hasn't been in our plan, just that we were on the hook to raise another $2 million that we really didn't start out in the original plan to do. And we've done that. So as soon as we can get the agreement um, signed by all the attorneys. So that's what we're bringing to the table today. This is just, as Kevin has stated, a continuation of our MOU to move forward with the project. So just that bridge till we can get to enough of the funding to get the incubator itself built. But we've been in the projects from, like you said, from day one. We helped with the, the grant for the 7.5 million. We secured the $2.5 million worth of the land from the city and transferred it to the county. I mean, we've been a partner at every stake of this process. And it really was just to be a sustainable home and model for the incubator project for the next 20 years. So that's really what we're trying to help support with the county. So do you have a, if I may, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, do you have a time certain when you're going to bring back to us a real plan? I get that your board thinks it's a great idea to raise money. I'm curious if there's anybody on there that knows what it takes to do that. Um, yes, and Chris, our chairman's here. Chris Paradise, if you want to say I, anything on behalf of the board. But um, yes, we do know. And we knew that when we were pushed, you know, kind of like bringing in the other, not push, but requested to do another $2 million and offered to do that. Sorry, it was a bad choice of words. We knew that was going to be a daunting task. And hopefully we were looking at a six month timeline to make that happen. And now we've got it pretty much done in four months. So we knew it was going to take a while to secure a couple million dollars. Um, we just thought we had another year and a half to get it done instead of six months. So. Hi, Chris. Hi. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. We do have a very qualified board. Um, we have a principal of Cherry Beckert. We have, uh, we have um, Roy Benger, who's the vice president of a bank. Um, yes, we have people that know what they're doing. We have a plan. We've always had a plan. Our plan changed in May. We were required to come up with an, an additional $2 million. We have come up with an additional $2 million. And all we have to do is finish the contracts for that. The $2 million is in the MOU, and we will be presenting that to you as soon as we can. But we would like to meet each of you individually and tell you about the opportunity that we've, we've brought to Pinellas County and all of the benefits that it brings to Pinellas County. The, you know, the partner that we're working with is promising to bring in $2 billion into the county. $2 billion? Or $2 billion with a B. Oh, well done. Um, it's, it's a major company. Cha-ching. Yeah, ka-ching. Um, so it is very exciting. It's the kind of thing that you dream of when you're in economic development. Um, and I'm, I'm just a volunteer economic development person. These kinds of economic development people that do it for a professional living understand just the kind of opportunity that this has brought. And it's only come to Pinellas County 
because of the relationship you have with Tanya and the Innovation Center, and only because we're, we're, we have this new building that's coming online, and the Innovation Center is an independent, exciting opportunity for this company coming down from New York to make a, a new and better kind of place like Austin or Silicon Valley. And they see us as up and coming in our region, and this is an opportunity where they can really leave their legacy on uh, the Southeast region. They want to have a South by Southeast that rivals South by Southwest. I mean, they're, they got big vision. So it's very exciting for us. It's really very exciting for you all. Um, it's, it's an amazing opportunity, and we will be able to present it to you. I think we, we're scheduling a meeting with you in a, in a week or so. Um, so oh, okay, I look forward to yeah. great yes. anticipation yeah. to yeah. hearing more. Yeah. And, and in order to get the $7.5 million grant, we had to sub submit a, st a strategic plan. In order to get the original MOU, we had to submit a plan. So our plan has actually went from maybe being an average plan to now being even larger and bigger and grander based on our opportunity to partner with some major corporations now that are coming to the table um, for our accelerator program funding as well as for the building itself for the capital campaign. So. Great. Well, that is exciting, and that's exactly what I wanted to hear, so thank you. Ho ho hold welcome. on one second, you all. Uh, Commissioner Flowers. Uh, thank you, Mr. You Chair. I just want to clarify a couple of things. The increase in the cost is because of the delay in the project. So that $2 million wasn't something that just happened. It was because of an increase in the project. So okay. it wasn't for the county to ever pay that additional $2 million. That, that should have always been for their organization to do that. That's number one. Number two, um, I, I learned a lot when I met with them. So you probably will find, um, for those of you that may not have had a chance to speak with them, you probably find that the information is very interesting and very promising. That's all I'm going to say. Um, the one thing I want us to and the reason I ask that they uh, address the community about what this will be is because, as you have heard, a lot of the technology components are very high tech. When you go into that community, that's not a high tech community. And the last thing I want to see is for something to come into a community and those persons around there just really don't benefit because that's not where they are. It may take them some time to get there. I'm not saying that they won't, and certainly putting in the piece with the K through 12 for that technology piece, because we see where it's growing in the AI fields. Um, but I just don't want something to be there that yet again, that community that surrounds it can't take advantage because that's not where they are. So uh, I think having this community um, piece will allow the organization StarTech to talk about their dream, their vision, their strategic plan. And it will also give them a chance to hear from the community as it relates to what they felt the interpretation of this building is, because I can assure you what you all are talking about is not where they were thinking when you talk about innovation. It kind of reminds me of Rising Tide in downtown. They have those individual office spaces and they're all, you know, they're techy and, and all of that. Um, but you still have to make room for other areas of business so that the community is able to utilize this. This could be huge if done right and everybody feeling like they are a part of the Ford movement. But again, my concern is that there was a timeline by which they needed to be able to dig some dirt or there were there's the potential that the county is no longer that partner and we're very close to that date. I think what also would work maybe even for me is if I could get a copy of the formal strategic plan or the enhanced strategic plan, because I don't have it, I don't know if anyone else does, that would help me to better understand some of the other component pieces that have occurred along the way. Um, the other thing I asked them was about different innovation projects that are nearby. Um, and the attorney that was on the phone um, said he had relationships with Venix incubation incubator um, innovation center I'm sorry over in um, in Tampa and whatnot because I just I'm gonna go over there and visit theirs I want to just see how it's you know one operates once it's up fu and fully functioning in in certain challenging communities so um, I just wanted to share that but thank you so much mr. Yeah. chair I am gonna support it because it could be huge for the community that it will be in 
but it just needs to make sure that it's also supporting the people yeah. that live in that community. That's one of the largest tracts of land that was left down there, and now it's yeah. going to have a good purpose. But it needs to it needs yeah. to be something that the community can utilize and support. Even though we have a someone who can bring a billion dollars, you could bring a billion dollars as a tech company, but it still doesn't help the people who live in the surrounding area. Yeah. Well, I think that the good news about this, and one of the things that I picked up from it, is that um, there are and I'm going to say it wrong, but there are there are jobs that uh, our kindergarten kids, the young people in our communities, um, um, don't even know are going to be in place for them to work in 20 years from now or 25 years from now, and they're going to seed or create. They're going to be created from innovation centers like this. In other words, these folks that are creating these these companies are going to build them into companies that are going to be looking for jobs and all of that, but we're not talking about jobs for next year or the year after that necessarily. These are long-term projects that companies start like this. Many of the big companies today started like this as a dream somewhere. It was probably in somebody's garage, but, you know, garage, and I know that was the name at one point, but, I mean, that's what we're talking about, something that is going to be building for the next generation or two. Um, and I, I'm, I'm excited about it. I think it's a really good program. I think there's a little frustration, but I think from 2019 to today, there's a few things that have happened that have slowed us down. And there was a change, but it was a firming up of the process and of the costs. And we, it's, it's reality. Costs have gone through the roof on construction costs. And so, and I'm hoping and praying that they're kind of simmering down just a little bit so that we can stop that exponential growth in costs. But that's certainly playing into this as well. So anyway, I, I think it, I'm, I'm excited about it. Got to bring it home now. And then that's not easy to do. I get it because, you know, the devil's in the details, as they say. Uh, but I was really um, optimistic based on what you were telling me today more so than I've ever been. So I'm excited about it, and I'll, I definitely will be supporting it today. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Second. Mo motion from Commissioner Justice for approval. Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Did we Karen vote? I didn't hear her. Uh, Karen, did you vote? I did, okay. yes. Sorry, we didn't, we didn't, I, we didn't hear you. Or, well, we don't think we heard you, but anyway, um, thank you. All right, we are moving on to uh, Emergency Medical Services Authority, item 27. These are amendments to the Emergency Medical Services Advanced Life Support First Responder Agreements with five municipalities and two independent fire districts. So you sitting as the Emergency Medical Services Authority uh, approve these agreements and they're listed within your packet. Was there, a, I, I, was there a question? I'm sorry, I thought I heard something. No, okay. Any questions on the item? And do I have a motion for approval? Move approval from Commissioner Flowers. Second. Second from Commissioner Long. And these are, as you said, six items that have been recommended for approval. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Okay, moving on to Housing Finance Authority, uh, item 28. This is a resolution approving the issuance of, um, by the Housing Finance Authority, of multifamily housing revenue bonds to finance a multifamily residential rental um, housing unit. Um, this was brought to you back in May. The project cost have went up, and so they're requesting an increase in the bond amount. And I understand that we have an Orrin Richkin who had signed up to speak on this item. Um, is he available? Uh, I can call on him, Mr. Chair. I also want to make sure you knew that Commissioner Seal has her hand up. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for letting me know. I don't see a hand, but uh, Commissioner Seal, go ahead. Thank you. I raise it in the Zoom platform. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So anyway, um, I had asked Barry quite a few questions about this particular, and I want to note that we only have a $900,000 home investment in it <clears throat> that is being um, 
deferred for repayment until 2045, which is done before. But the, and it sounds like a very complicated project, but in the information that Barry gave me, it sounds like they are going, the city of Clearwater is gonna do a third party financial overview. And I'm wondering whether this is time sensitive and we can wait until the results of that overview is done. Um, bottom line is we are agreeing to subordinate our loan, the 900,000. Um, the developer fee has gone up um, a bit and it doesn't appear that they've deferred any of their profit. And I kind of just have a, um, <clears throat> I have a little bit of a problem with that. I could have um, both Tom and Catherine come up and, uh, and address this, so. But it is a very complicated project. <laughs> Hi, I'm Catherine Driver with the Housing Finance Authority. Hold on one second. Sure. I just want to make sure we take care of this. It's not me. Can you just turn it off or? Thank you. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Catherine Driver with the Housing Finance Authority, and Oren Richkin, who's on the phone, is the developer, so he's also available to answer questions, um, the gentleman who had um, called in for comments. So first off, we're asking you to approve the TEFRA hearing to increase the bond allocation amount. The um, request to resubordinate your $900,000 is going to come before the board at a later date. After that financial, oh, I'm so sorry. I've gotten used to wearing it now. Um, so the request to resubordinate your um, home loan or is going to be coming to, before you at a later date after that financial, that third party financial analysis is done. So this is just requesting approval to um, approve the TEFRA hearing that was held to increase the bond amount from the 14 point, um, Two five to twenty million dollars, and um, yes, there was an increase in the developer fee, but that is being deferred and put back into the project. And they are um, putting a seller note into the project of their own funds of ten point three million dollars. So they're very invested in this project, and um, there's a, a big commitment from the developer here. Um, this project has not had any rehabilitation done in almost 20 years. Um, they've had some air conditioning HVAC issues, some water intrusion issues, and obviously it needs to be updated. And um, when they did their capital needs assessment, it was determined that they needed to have some ADA compliance done to the project. And this is a concrete block construction project from the 1950s. So it's gonna take quite a bit of um, money and time and effort to um, bring the um, development up to modernization as well as ADA compliance. Um, this project is currently in the credit underwriting process. That's a requirement for the low income housing tax credits and the bond financing. Um, this will come back to the HFA board at their November meeting for final bond approval, um, assuming that we get a favorable credit underwriting report. The credit underwriting report does look at all of these um, sources and uses of funds, where they're coming from. Can can the transaction support this? And they will also let us know that the $20 million is a sufficient amount of bonds. There have been times where they've said, you don't need that much, and so we will not issue the $20 million. We just wanted to have the ability to issue that if it was needed. So, um, so Mr. Richkin is the new owner. Yes, they're, they are the current owner, and um, they have another entity that was set up to do the acquisition because to okay, do rehabilitation, okay. you have to have an ac acquisition yeah. <laughs> in conjunction with the rehabilitation in order to access the tax credits. I got it. So um, Mr. Richkin is on the phone, and he's available to answer any questions you all may have, or I know Commissioner Seal had some additional questions, and I'm hoping I answered them. Commissioner Seal. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. You're welcome. Would you like me to go ahead and call him, Mr. Yeah, Richkin? just yeah, if he has any comments, apparently right at this moment, we don't have any questions Ms. for him, but he might have a comment. Mr. Richkin, can you raise your hand in the application? I do not have your name listed, Mr. Richkin. I don't know if you're the phone number that's ending in 0634.
Mr. Richkin, do you, can you unmute yourself? Okay, is that better? I can hear you. Would you please go ahead okay, and state your right. name and your name and your address for the uh, record, please? Yes, certainly. Uh, my name is Oren Richkin, O-R-E-N-R-I-C-H-K-I-N. Um, I'm also on the phone here with Mark Hess, who heads up the development um, shop at Hall Keen Management. Um, and we were just on the phone to uh, potentially answer any questions that you all might have. Um, I don't know, Mark, if you want to say anything. Sure. This is Mark Hess, uh, 1 Spruce Avenue, Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. And um, uh, I'm sorry I didn't make the 5 o'clock cutoff, so uh, Orrin patched me in here. Um, I'm not sure if that uh, worked for the protocol, but I'm also available to answer any questions you might have uh, regarding the application. Okay. Any questions? I have a I'm not. Oh, okay. Commissioner Flowers. Did, did Ms. Seals have questions as well? I, I, I'm not hearing. I'm, I, I've oh. said it now a couple of times. I haven't heard from her, so I'm assuming oh. Karen is, or Commissioner Seals. Good. I just didn't want to skip her. <laughs> you well, want. thank you. I, I've been listening, so um, I, I'm glad that it will be coming back to us with the financial review for final approval. Thank you. Correct. My question was, so sure. this was owned by the Housing Authority? No, um, this transaction was originally done with Bank of America, okay. and then um, Mark, can you re can you say which year was it? Twenty twelve when you all took over um, this property. That's right. 2012. Okay. So in twenty twelve, um, Hall Keen took over ownership and management of the property, and um, so since then they've been working on what needs to happen at this property and they've been managing it. So now it's time for the acquisition and rehab, but it was never with the housing authority. Okay. Um, it's always, it was originally financed with bonds from the housing finance authority. HUD section eight participants are um, there, residents here there, or? There may be folks who have a section eight voucher. I don't think that there's any project based vouchers. Is okay. that correct, Mark? Or They're Orrin? not correct. Yes. Okay. So there may be correct. folks who have, um, you know, a regular Section 8 voucher, and they could be living there um, as they can in any really multifamily development, but there are no project-based vouchers here. And so with them securing these dollars, does that require that the rents stay within a certain parameter and not exceed yes. and yes. move into market rate? Yes. Um, because of um, the tax-exempt bonds and the low-income housing tax credits that are coming, there are um, rent restrictions, and those rents are published by Florida Housing um, on an annual basis, and they have to adhere to those um, rents. So they, it is, um, and it's through a land use restriction agreement. Um, which is typically for 30 to 50 years. Okay, and is there full occupancy occupancy currently at this complex? I guess that can go to the- Yeah, list. Mark, can you answer that? I, um, typically these all run at 99 yeah. to 100%. They're, they're usually in very high demand. The reason I'm asking it is because through the rehab and, and uh, upgrades that would potentially inconvenience or disrupt the persons that are living there. So what's the plan for those individuals that are living mm -hmm. here, because when you're at yeah. almost full occupancy, same issues they're having now in Jordan Park, there's nowhere for them to go on the right. other side. So they're having to move out, which then sure. becomes a whole issue with, right. yeah, so that's why I'm asking that question. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure Mark and Oren yeah, can that's a, address that. that that's a, it's a great question, um, and it's an area where we've been spending a lot of time to, to manage a plan because it's, it's both difficult for the general contractor, you know, because they want as much running room as they can get, and it's difficult for the staff for coordination, and um, it can be an inconvenience for the residents as well. Um, so our our plan is to we're in the the mid to high 90s for occupancy right now. Our plan is, um, you know, once we've got uh, all parties that have approved the terms of the transaction, is to let we have about uh, four units that turn a month. And so as we ramp up in the construction, we will um, not refill vacancies so that we can get a block of about 20 units. And that rent, uh, units will be renovated uh, and complete, and then residents will move into newly renovated units. 
uh, and then the, that will free up a next block of units that gets renovated. And that, that's the general phasing plan that we have right now for the, for the project. The, the nature of the work is not such that it can be an occupied rehab because we're gutting the kitchens in the baths and we're putting new HVAC in and all the flooring and it's just not conducive to working around um, the families. Thank you, that's why I was asking because yes. I, I thought it might be quite mm -hmm. intrusive for yes. anyone to remain in a mm -hmm. unit. And, and thank you for answering how you plan to um, handle vacating those units for rehab. Thank you. Yeah, and it'll be obviously much needed rehab and it'll be so much better for the residents, but that you're right, that transition is, well, it's tough on everybody. You know, developers, contractors, they'd love to have it just empty. It's like a clean slate, you know, and then you go in and do all the demolition and it just makes it much easier. So it's gonna be yeah. tough on everybody, yeah. but when it's finished, it's gonna be much, much better. Yeah, so. and, and let us know if you're interested in seeing before renovation and yeah. then obviously coming and seeing it yeah. after renovation. You know, you're more than welcome to reach out and we can make arrangements for that. Okay, great. Any other comments or questions? Yes, one. Um, I mean, this is, <clears throat> for many, many years, was an eyesore in Clearwater in the North Greenwood neighborhood. So I'm thankful that something even more, it's been renovated, but to take it to a higher level, that's greatly yeah. appreciated. Yeah, Thank a good you. comment. I didn't, when you said it was, how, how old did you say it was originally? From 2002. I mean, well, the buildings are from the 1950s, yeah. but so, um, the, the first transaction yeah. was done in 2002. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, so did I get a motion or how about a motion? Commissioner Flowers on the motion, second from Commissioner Justice. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Under Pinellas County Community Redevelopment Agency, item 29. Item number 29 is um, sitting as a community redevelopment agency, approved the uh, FY22 Alamo and Community Redevelopment Area Work Plan. Proposed work includes 2.75 uh, million in tax increment financing for projects as outlined by Chris when he presented his recent plans. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Long. Any questions on the plan? I, it's hard to believe. It's already you said it's 2.75 million. Correct. Tax, the, the incremental financing piece. It, yep. And total budget, which yeah. is the next item, is 3.2 million. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing, though, in this, <laughs> this short period of time. Um, I know we have David Lee here, and he's in person, actually, and I just saw him walk around the corner. And before we d take any action, um, coming up, David, you are recognized. State your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. Hey there, it's uh, David Lee, 4425 uh, 46th Avenue in the Neary Park neighborhood. Um, of the CRA, and I just wanted to stop by and, um, you know, make sure that you guys have uh, looked really closely at this work plan um, right here. It's 31 items. And, um, you know, I think what we really need in here right now is um, some balloons and some confetti. Um, because, man, you look through this thing and there's all kinds of cool items. Um, it's really exciting. Um, it's right up there with, the, you know, the prospect of 62nd Avenue being four lanes to spur economic development and jobs. Um, so that, that's really exciting. Um, and just to point out, uh, you know, item 26, the generator, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's this beautiful Caterpillar generator that sits next to the exchange. And, um, you know, when Hurricane Elsa came through and threatened the county, uh, the Lillman Exchange was one of only two storm shelters that were activated. And, um, you know, that building is like, it's built like Fort Knox and that was, a, you know, now we have backup power there and that was a really proud moment for us, having that asset, showing it off and then the community gets to use it. Um, you know, it's also a great way to advertise that our CRA is high and dry, uh, no flood insurance. I think we can handle like 25 feet of storm surge and we're, we're fine, no big deal. Um, so, so that's really cool. Um, you know, on these residential grants, item two, um, you know, a lot of people, as you've heard, are using them for concrete driveways. 
And I wasn't really thrilled about that idea in the beginning, but kind of what happened is, you know, we watched a driveway go in. It's a concrete, nice piece of residential infrastructure. And then the next thing you know, it looks really great. And then there's jealousy on the block. And so what you see <laughs> is the neighbor down the street, you know, eight months later gets a driveway and then that creates more jealousy and then somebody else gets a driveway. Um, and so you see it sparking out and, you know, cool stuff happening. And so if you picture that, you know, you have an approved house, you have a driveway tying into the street, you know, all we're really missing in that scenario are curbs and fully piped drainage. And so we're kind of inching forward closer and closer to complete streets and complete neighborhoods. And so curbs and, you know, fully piped drainage, that, that, that's important. Um, but I thought it was pretty cool, the, the driveway effect. Um, and then with the park, you see tons of, tons of park investments on here, and they're, they're really strategic. Um, one of the big problems, challenges, is that our main asset, Neary Park, doesn't really bleed into the neighborhood except for at a few points. And if you look on here, items, what is it, uh, six, nine, and 10, those, uh, the, those investments uh, bleed the park into the neighborhood. Go ahead, so, go ahead. Yeah, and so that's a really big uh, deal because we get that value out into the neighborhood. Uh, very dialed in as far as what we need. And so I would just say to you that this plan right here, I hope you look through it, it's, it's uh, pretty good. It's proof of what happens um, when, when staff steps up their game and when the community steps up their game, yeah. um, when our CRA board gets better, um, you, you get stuff like this and then everybody talks to each other and you, you get plans like this. And so it, it works yeah. and uh, I just hope you take a few minutes yeah. to look through it. And yeah, I, 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 I really like your, your, your review of what's going on, your, your critical eye on things that are going on in the community. And, you obviously have a big passion for that area, and we love it too. And we're just so excited about what's going on. And uh, you're right; it takes time. These are steps that we're taking towards even better things going on in that community. So, um, I, I, I'm really—I mean, our, our team has really worked hard. But as you said, the community is engaged and giving us good feedback too. So, yeah, it's a good partnership, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Go ahead. David, would you repeat the, the story you shared in your email to me about your neighbor who attended their first CRA meeting? Yeah, um, my neighbor attended his first CRA meeting and um, you know, he, he, came, he came away from it and he's like, who are these people? And I'm like, well, they represent us uh, on the board. And he's like, you mean they're fighting for us? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, how much do they get paid? And I'm like, well, they don't get paid. It's a volunteer position. And he was like, he was like, wow, I never knew that even existed. And so it was like this feeling of uh, a, a citizen, a resident being represented for the first time. And so that was really cool. But that's the type of thing that goes on in the Lumen Exchange. Um, it's a you know little microcosm of democracy. And every time somebody gets invested, it pays off. And uh, so I I love seeing that stuff. It's super cool. Yeah. So. Thank you for sharing yeah. that story. Any other questions for David? All right. Well, I appreciate your being here and uh, sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Any other comments uh, on item 29, the fiscal uh, 2022 redevelopment area work plan? Do I have a motion for approval? I did? Okay. I already did. I already had a second. So all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, I didn't hear you, Karen. I'm sorry. Aye. Okay, thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 30. And then this is sitting as the CRA um, board uh, to uh, adopt the $3.2 million total um, budget uh, for, the, uh, for the area. And this is, we'll transmit it to you as the board of commissioners. So it's a perfunctory exercise. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Justice. I didn't hear who the second was. Commissioner. Peter, sorry about that, Commissioner Peters. No other questions. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, moving on to item 31 under county attorney. Yes, under item number 31, I recommend hey. you adopt 
Yeah. Adopt the proposed resolution approving the early extension of the 2021 tax rolls. This will allow the tax collector to get the tax bills out in a timely manner. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Long and second by Commissioner Gerard. Any questions, comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, under item number 32, this is our placeholder that we have for um, any sort of news or questions about redistricting. The redistricting board that you all appointed, I guess a couple or so meetings ago now, um, they did have their first meeting. Uh, it was somewhat of an organizational meeting. They did select a chair and a vice chair. They got some training on Sunshine Law and public records. Um, and their next meeting will be on October the 6th. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you for that. It was a it was a really good meeting, and um, and just for the record, I wanted I wanted folks to understand that the uh, the intent f from my perspective was to have these um, these redistricting board meetings televised. The question uh, from staff was whether the first one was was needed because it was organizational. I had a resident um, by the name of Dave Happy, who we've all gotten to know over the past year and a half, call me and ask me about whether or not um, we could televise it. And I said, well, I've been in meetings all day, um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to make it happen. So I called Kevin, and he and Barbara made it happen so that uh, we were able to televise the first meeting, um, and we will be doing that subsequently. And I think it was really important um, uh, to hear uh, to, that people really wanted to listen. And, and, and I think I got a call that said, well, there's, it looks like 20 or 30 people. And then I said, well, it was absolutely worth it. If it was one person that wanted to listen, it was worth doing that. And I think it's important to be transparent on this process. So anyway, I just wanted that uh, for the record. Um, County Administrator. Um, first, uh, for the commissioners, um, you can't replace Bill Berger. Um, but we did have to because he's going to be off climbing mountains somewhere or doing something. Um, we went through an extensive process, and I'm happy to introduce to you Chris Rose, who is the new incoming director of our Office of Management and Budget. So come on up, Chris. Chris comes to us. He was the budget director for the city of Miami. Uh, prior to that, he worked for a number of years for uh, Miami-Dade County as both um, in the budget office, working his way up through the budget office, then he actually became the assistant director out at Solid Waste and assistant director out at Public Works. So he has both budget experience, operational experience, and so he brings a wealth of knowledge um, and uh, was selected through our selection process. Well, welcome. Um, Thank really, you. Really, and I'm glad you took your mask off so at least we can recognize you if we see you walking down the hall. Yes, sir. Um, you have a couple comments? You're welcome. No, Mr. Chair, thank you. And commissioners, thank you for having me. And I want to say thank you to the administrator and his whole team for inviting me on this journey. This is, uh, this is going to be good. Uh, I look forward to bringing forward the information that we all need to make those hard decisions that we know are coming. So uh, just thanks for having me, and everybody's been great okay. so far. Again, welcome. Good thank to you. have you. Okay. Anything and, else, Barry? Yeah, well, just, yeah. I got <laughs> one more. Um, you all are aware of this one because she comes right from our own staff. But Cynthia Johnson, Dr. Cynthia Johnson is here, and she is our new director of our Economic Development Department. Congratulations. I know Commissioner would like this color. I, I did this for you, Commissioner. But I just want to say thank you all so much for having confidence in me to move our organization forward. Uh, the team and I are so excited about this new direction of really cultivating the relationships and building strong partnerships so that we can have a strong economy. So I am excited, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Excellent. Con congratulations. And the final piece to my update is to um, provide you a little bit of um, COVID update. Um, and so we have seen slight increases um, as of yesterday, and this has actually went down a little bit today, but as of ye yesterday, our seven day percent positivity was at 16.3%, um, still extremely high. Um, this is very, very serious, but it is had, had, that has been coming down. It was over 22% at one point over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, that uh, equals a seven day case count of 686 um, um, new cases. 
Um, that's a seven day average. Uh, again, two weeks ago, we were a little over 900. Um, we're cautiously optimistic that we're turning the corner uh, with these decreases in cases and in hospitalizations. Uh, last week's uh, total case count is 5,663. The previous, uh, 5,693. The previous week was 6,790. Um, you know, but again, as Dr. Thogmorton said, you know, we're seeing younger uh, age groups. 10 to 19 is the highest age group um, of new COVID cases. Um, but again, it's been declining. Uh, death is a lagging indicator. Unfortunately, we've seen um, higher deaths uh, during the pandemic now than at any time during the pandemic. The week of um, August 15th, we had 104 deaths. Uh, last week, or no, I'm sorry, the 22nd, we had um, 97 deaths. Again, you've seen it in the news. Hospitals are reporting a slight decrease in their both ERs and in admissions. Um, and some hospitals are actually talking about restarting some of their elective surgeries. Um, so we'll, we'll monitor it. The biggest issue, obviously, is when you have COVID out there, then you have staffing issues. Well, they already have staffing issues because of the nature and what everybody's dealing with. And now when you have more staff that's out with COVID, then it becomes very difficult. So it seems to be catching up a little bit. And they're being able to manage that, but it's still a very, uh, very tough situation. Uh, fully vaccinated, so uh, we have 55% of our total population, 61%. Uh, six, uh, 12 years and older, and 63% 18 years and older, 79.5% um, above 65. Um, but you know we've seen that slow, so we're seeing new new people get um, get vaccinated. But we're at 6,400 um, a week new vaccinations versus we were over 10,000 there when this kind of first started peaking up again. But again, that's that that's getting caught up. I'm sure people that get uh, that are catching COVID. Now they're waiting periods before they would go get the vaccination. So there's several things going on there. Barry, and if you Barry get, on these numbers, these all these numbers that you're saying, are they anywhere where residents can track them we're, or see we're them? building out at your request, we're building out the dashboard, um, but you've also seen it's very difficult to get information and get up to date information. But we're gonna, we're, we're gonna try to, we're, we're gonna have that up by next week and we're gonna post this information there. Okay. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, it's fine. I mean, that's fine. And, and even like the, the monoclonal uh, antibody site. Uh, so we've, we've treated 2,667 individuals um, there. Again, it's located at 409 o o Old Coachman Road. Um, that's actually seeing some positive effects. But if you go through the treatment, there's, you have to have a period of time. I think it's like six weeks before you can actually get another vaccination or to get vaccinated. So there'll be some lag periods and times depending upon where you're at um, within your treatment series. Um, what we're preparing very, for- Very, real quick, when you say you're getting positive results, are we hearing that from the hospitals, from the health department, who, who we- from, from the health department. I mean, it seems to be an effective treatment. Okay. Um, I mean, it's but, good to hear. I just yeah. was curious who you were hearing from. And um, you, and we do have information up on our on the CDC, but we're trying to build out our own our own yeah. dashboard. The, what I also wanted to really talk about is is we're preparing for the booster. Um, you know, we we know that there's going to be a a rush, just as we've seen before when this comes out. Currently, if you're auto, um, if you have. Um, um, immune compromised, you can get a booster at your pharmacy right now. Um, but we're expecting in later September, it says the 20th, but we'll see that the booster will, will be out and available. We, um, we're gonna be putting out, I'm not gonna say where or anything yet, but we, we've um, contracted for a large site uh, to where not only we can do additional testing, but we can also space out and do other types of services, including boosters. Um, and so that'll be forthcoming because we're trying to prepare for what, how we can manage this in the long run. It's gonna be in Central County um, and that'll be available for everyone. Um, just be from a logistics standpoint, it's very, very difficult to operate multiple sites as you can imagine. Um, so that uh, um, has more information to come on that. Um, that is the extent of my update. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, Barry, um, before we all start doing the happy dance, because it appears numbers are going down, I would really uh, urge us to be very cautious and optimistically hopeful just because 
I'm very concerned about the the numbers that we may see a couple weeks from now from mm -hmm. Labor Day weekend, number one. And number two, uh, for those of us that have been paying attention to college football, and we all know tonight the Bucks are playing at Raymond James, go Bucks! Uh, they're anticipating 60,000 people in that stadium, and they don't have any uh, requirements for a mask. Um, it's problematic to me at best, but let's just hope and pray that we don't end up in a real quagmire as a result. You know, I, I think it, we're seeing the, the numbers that I said are down, but these are serious numbers. These are, these are peaks from anything we saw last year, even at our height. Um, the, the, the best chance to combat that, and you have a much lower chance, and that has been proven over and over again, is to get vaccinated. And so if you're not vaccinated, you get vaccinated. It significantly lowers your chance of, uh, one, contracting it, but two, if you do, of having serious effects. So um, we'll continue to monitor it. We're going to make um, all these different things as they come on. Uh, available. We'll, we'll do additional testing, but again, you have the pharmacies. Uh, we have the one monoclonal site. We may, uh, we, we'll see how that goes and where we where we end up with that. We do have the testing down at the um, Center for Healthy St. Pete, and uh, we're going to look at this new centralized site. So, one more thing, Mr. Chair, if I might, please, uh, for the for clarification for our listening public, while we've been in this meeting today. I've received a couple of emails from folks who have been watching us, and they are confused about the fact that they uh, had sent in some comments prior to the meeting uh, for, for citizens to be heard, and today they didn't really hear a lot of citizens that were participating, and they wondered if they had missed something that suddenly are meeting is on a Thursday rather than our normal Tuesday, and maybe we could address that a little bit for folks who are confused. Well, just that nor just the reason we shifted from Tuesday to Thursday. We've is done, yeah, we've done that. I'm going to look, it, Joel, you want to address that? I was going to bring I can Bill Berger it. up, but. <laughs> this, the, the reason why the meeting today is on a Thursday, and you will all, almost always see a meeting of the Board of County Commissioners right. on a Thursday during September because of the statutorily required time frames for adopting your budget. So we have um, very rigid time frames um, that talk about, you know, certain dates and dates in between hearings. But importantly, we also may not conflict with the school board um, hearings. And I know that their first public hearing is next Tuesday when you might expect that we would have a meeting. But that's why it's on a Thursday. And you will always find during the month of September that the county commission will have one of its meetings on a Thursday to comply with those very rigid um, statutory guidelines for adopting your budget. And, and I think every other meeting, you can almost say, every time I say every, but is always on Tuesday, either whether it's at 9.30 in the morning or two and six in the afternoon, but yeah. Correct. So. I just think in going forward in the future that sometime maybe in the meetings in August, it would be wise to yeah, make I those agree. comments about our September agenda, just so people don't get confused and wonder what's going on. I'd just like to thought. think, I, I'd like to think that I remember to have said it, but I more than likely forgot to do that. So. <laughs> um, yeah, that's always a good idea to give as much heads up as we can. Commissioner Gerard. Well, and it might be good to just let them know that just about anybody that's voting on a budget in September, any of these entities that are voting on a budget are going to be probably at a different time or day yeah. because we all have to squeeze them in somewhere. Yeah. Like PSTA yeah. has a 6.30 meeting when we never do that. The license board has 6.30 meeting. Yeah. I know, I know it's been on the on our website, but I apologize for not bringing it up at the last meeting. It's, it's certainly... Uh, something that happens, you know, every year for for us, and we're we're used to it. But we certainly understand residents not being that way. So, um, anything, anything else from anybody? Nothing. Okay. All right. So uh, we move on to item 34 under county commission, and we have 
appointments to the Pinellas Public Library Cooperative Board. Um, Barry, you're making a yeah. This th we're this is a changing. Um, um, Brian and Jeffrey's been on before, but Bill is leaving, and so or this is a request to add Chris Moore um, in his stead. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Justice, a second by Commissioner Peters. Any comments, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 34, this is appointments to the Youth Advisory Committee, and I will look to Commissioner Peters for this Thank item. you, Mr. Chair. There are 37 uh, students that have applied to be on oh. that uh, board. Um, and nice. this year, instead of eliminating anybody, we'd like to move to approve all 37. Uh, students, Ashley sent you a side-by-side because -side you've been interested in the past about what schools are all coming from, so that's in your email if you want to take a look. Um, it'll be similar to this year. They'll do Zoom meetings and tours, and then uh, what the topics of the Zoom meetings and what the tours will be will be determined once they meet and come up with their plan for the year. Um, there will be a big change in that this year they're going to be using the 4-H curriculum and workbooks. We haven't done that in the past. They're going to be used, I didn't hear you. The 4-H curric curriculum and workbooks because oh. this committee is a partnership with 4-H. Um, and 4-H has uh, done a complete overhaul on their curriculums. Um, and their mental health curriculum fit in very nicely with um, the mental health uh, projects that they were working on. Um, and the vast majority of the committee members last year got um, certified in uh, mental health first aid. And so <laughs> on their resumes, you'll see many of them, if you look at the resumes, you'll see many of them are, are um, certified in mental health first aid. And so uh, there'll be um, other life skills and, and uh, other issues that they'll be taking on if that's part of what these uh, board members choose to do. That's awesome. Again, to you and to Ashley, congratulations. It's, it's a lot of work to, to pull this together, but my gosh, 37. So we really, our resolution calls for 25, so we, when you say your, the motion would be to approve all 37, all 37, and that'll be coming from Commissioner Peters on the, on the motion, Commissioner Flowers on the second. Any comments or questions for Commissioner Peters? Again, thank you. Sure. Yeah. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any, aye. any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Um, under item 36, county commission new business, anything from you all, committee board updates, anything you want to bring up there? Um, and I'll just look around to see if anybody has. Commissioner Flowers, and then we'll come to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, some of you may have read it, or um, I'm not sure if you saw, but it was a resolution that came from the city of St. Petersburg relative to um, addressing equity within their city and some other cities are doing it so um i just want to know if there's any interest for us to maybe put it on a workshop agenda not saying that we necessarily adopt their specific resolution but just to talk about some of the components that are in there a lot of the pieces we're already doing the uh, Commissioner Long's uh, favorite, which is sustainability and resiliency, is certainly in there. Um, I believe we're addressing equity in a number of ways, but maybe not specifically an equity officer, but I think we're doing it in a number of ways across platforms. And just some other things that I think we are doing that are present in that resolution. Um, so again, just bringing it up to see if there's any interest in maybe talking about it at a workshop, um, certainly if uh, Barry doesn't have it sending it over to you for you to peruse and see what it is yeah, that they're um, talking about Yeah, if you if you don't mind could you send something to Barry and yes. when Barry and I talk we've got this uh, Work session schedule um, starting September 16th and by the way, you know plan on being here a little as we've got some a lot of items on there and then we have it scheduled out really in October, we have two in October, uh, one in November, one in December. But we'll look to see if we can. It's no rush. On no, it. I understand. Yeah. But if we if we've got some time, depending on the on the items, we might be able to. We've added a couple, for instance, in the last week or two. So, if we've got some time to do that before the calendar year, we'll we'll try okay. to fit that in. Thank you. Yeah. That was Any it. anything else, um, Commissioner Justice? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple uh, things. Uh, one. I had the opportunity to be downtown St. Pete over the weekend and the uh, power boat racing, uh, which we are one of the sponsors. Um, just a beautiful day, 40 boats racing around uh, the waterfront, uh, made for great video footage and photos that will be shared around the world. And so uh, just a, a cool event that uh, 
uh, we had going on there. So I just wanted to point that out. And then I just wanted a, a kind of a shout out to, um, and I know a lot of people do a lot of things, but uh, the folks in Gulfport, the merchants in Gulfport led by John, John Reisbeck, uh, who owns Smoke and Jay's Barbecue. Uh, he put together a 26 foot trailer truck with $40,000 worth of supplies that he and his team carted up uh, to uh, the Gulf Coast for the victims of Hurricane Ida. So just wanted to shout out for them doing the good work and, and appreciate what they that's, do. That's awesome. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Justice. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Flowers, I would be very interested in talking about that resolution as well. I think it was uh, racism in public policy or something. Anyway. Um, the thing I had, uh, <laughs> I was looking at the uh, work session schedule and there's, there is a lot on next week. Um, and I thought that I was going to be able to zoom in. I have to be at a, uh, a stone setting, which is something that Jewish people do a, a year after somebody dies. Well, it's two years um, up in Cleveland. And I thought I'd be able to tune in because we have a 6.30 a.m. flight. I don't know what we were thinking. But now they've changed our flight, so I won't be there. I won't be off the plane until probably 11. So I'm just wondering, if, particularly, um, I hate to miss the American Rescue Plan because I've been bugging Barry about it for months. We can, we can, but, we can, um, we can shift it around. I don't, well, so. I don't, I don't want to put that off. It's been no, no. I don't mean to another day. I'm just saying yeah. maybe uh, the manufactured housing thing. I would really like to at least listen to. Could we put that towards the end of the agenda? So maybe I could. Um, Barry, is what, do we have flexibility on that on keeping it in different places during the meeting? Oh no, sure. We can we can move those around. Staff will be here. So okay. okay. I don't as long as we can do them on that day. I don't think there's a. Yeah. A rush for any particular yeah, order. Well, as long as I can listen in. Well, so we'll we'll move uh, one and two to the okay. to back to the back end, and Perfect. hopefully, hopefully you will have landed and can participate yeah, or listen. It's, yeah, when workshops are not as concerned about you know the medical right. procedure, all that stuff. So we're good. You can participate um, in those discussions and hear it too. So no okay. issues. Anything else, Great. Commissioner? No, Jarrett? that's it. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Yes. Uh, I don't know how many of you may or may not have tuned in last night to the Grand Canal presentation that was made uh, in Tierra Verde, but I wanted to extend a shout out to Brian Lowack and Kelly Levy. I mean, they were amazing. I thought Kelly was outstanding because for over two hours she took questions from folks that were participating. and I seem to recall her saying there were over a hundred people that had questions that wanted to and she just went through every one of them without missing a beat and was right on point i'm so proud of her so anyway i i think we have come out of that with a very good um forward movement in terms of how staff will approach moving forward right barry I think so. I think I think that you know, obviously, not everybody's going to be in agreement. But I right. think that the revised proposal that she worked on really, um, I, m the majority of people feel that is a much more equitable way yeah. of distributing. Yeah, I mean, they actually calls. had a couple of polls that they did, and people participated of uh, ninety something percent of them. So I thought that was very positive, and um, and I also want to commend Barry for his leadership and the rest of the team on putting together that meeting with the uh, folks that are very concerned about the issues going on in John's Pass. I thought that was extremely well done. And uh, their patience in listening to the concerns and questions was outstanding. So I just wanted to say that to everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Law. You're welcome. Good stuff. Um, anybody else? And I just had a couple things real quickly. Um, just so you know, I'm uh, going to uh, be assigning Herb Polson, as he frequently does, to serve as uh, my alternate on the canvassing board for the November 2021 election. So he he has agreed to do it as he's he loves to do it, and you know how he's uh, always at the ready to do it. So. Um, 
Second thing I had uh, is uh, an illumination of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge for Red Ribbon Week. Um, and so that request has been made for October 24th to 31st. So I just need a motion to approve so that I can send this letter of no objection to the FDOT. Motion for Commissioner Flowers. Second, did you say? Yeah, no, I was wondering what red, red ribbon. I'm sorry, Commissioner Peters. I apologize, Commissioner Peters. Motion. And who did the second? <laughs> Thank you, guys. I, it's hard. It's hard to yeah, keep me straight, Charlie. I know it's a hard job to do, but all right. Motion by Commissioner Flowers. Second by Commissioner Peters. Um, and um, I will tell you that um, she is um, Mary Ann Dean, Overdose Data to Action Coordinator for the Department of Health, um, is asking that we uh, light up the, uh, the Skyway in honor of Red Ribbon Week. Um, and um, it's just really to bring attention to um, health and wellness of our residents, especially in drug prevention, to our most vulnerable population, which is our kids. So, all right. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> I know I'm listening for Commissioner Seal. I didn't hear her. Aye. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any opposed? Uh, motion carries unanimously. And then just one brief comment under um, com committee and board updates. Um, the Tampa Bay Water, uh, we started, oh gosh, back in December, we um, let our general manager go and uh, uh, put in an, in an interim general manager, uh, Chuck Carden. And we've gone through the process. We've, we had interviews, all day interviews, um, uh, a couple of weeks, a week ago. Gosh, it seems like a couple of weeks ago, but, uh, and it came, it, we have decided to, uh, to let it settle. We've got two finalists. And we're just, everybody just, uh, there was, uh, and, and the internal candidate actually did a, a great job. I was really, really proud of his effort, uh, Chuck Carden. And then Heath Lloyd from Savannah um, just did an incredible job interviewing. Um, a little less experience as water, the water f facilities that he manages is a lot smaller. Uh, but he did a really nice job interviewing, and there was kind of a split feeling about it, and we all just decided to kind of wait on it, and we'll, at our meeting coming up next week, not Monday, but a week from Monday, we'll make that decision for our new general manager at Tampa Bay Water. So with that said, if I don't see anybody else, Karen, did you have anything? Oops. No, thank you. Okay. All right, so we are adjourned until 6 o'clock, and we'll take up the, uh, the budget at that time, budget and hearings and at that time. And food is here. Excuse me? And food is here. Okay. All right, we are officially adjourned. Thank you.
take the opportunity to welcome everybody to our public hearing portion of the of the evening. And it really today is just one public hearing, and it's to do a tentative millage and tentative budget uh, adoption of the tentative millage and tentative um, budget tonight. That's what we're here to do. Um, I also wanted to welcome Commissioner Seal. Good to have you here. Um, and um, just just so that folks understand, just perspective here that the order of business and content of this first public hearing on the fiscal year 2022 budget is mandated by Florida statutes, specifically Florida statute section 200.065. At this hearing, at this one tonight, the Board of County Commissioners will be doing will be adopting resolutions that approve tentative millage rates and budgets for various entities for which the board is the taxing authority. Adoption of the attached resolutions provides the FY22 proposed millage rates within the statutory requirements. Final approval of the millage rates and budgets will occur at the final public hearing on September 21st, 2021, which must be noticed by prescribed advertisements in a newspaper of general circulation in the community. And that one will be on Tuesday. So it's not two weeks from today. It's slightly short of two weeks from today. It'll be a Tuesday night instead of a Thursday night. Tuesday night's the regular time of our meetings. This happens to be a little different. So don't come here next uh, two weeks from today. Come here on Tuesday on uh, September 21st. Um, so um, has any correspondence been received regarding the tentative millages and tentative budget? Yes, Mr. Chair, two letters and 24 phone calls have been received regarding the tentative budget. Okay. Yes. Do you have any summary of the contents of them that tell us anything in particular or? Uh, the only information that I have is that the 24 phone calls came through the budget office itself, so possibly the budget office may be able to address content. Oh, are they? Okay. Thank you. I didn't get down that far. Go ahead. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, the two letters are attached to the agenda item, and uh, those letters, uh, from what I saw, were related to Turning Point and a question about the budget related to Turning Point, which I believe we covered earlier today. Yes. Uh, the phone calls, there was nothing that was specific in terms of questions that we found to be notable. Uh, a portion of those, and I forget what the number is, uh, were actually transferred to the property appraiser and or tax collector, which is customary. Okay. Because oftentimes I have questions that, that would be covered by those offices. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the open public hearing begins. Good evening, tonight's public hearing is the first of two public hearings for consideration and adoption of the FY22 millages and budgets. Before we get started, I'll walk through the sequence of events for tonight. Number one, the county administrator will present changes to the proposed budget since it was originally presented to the board on July 13th. Two, the county administrator will provide a budget overview presentation that incorporates these changes. Three, we will accept public comment on the following property tax levies and budgets by the following taxing authority classification. The BCC countywide levy for the Pinellas County General Fund and the county levy supporting the Health Department Fund. Secondly, the levies for dependent special districts and unincorporated area municipal services taxing units that going forward will be referred to as MSTUs. Dependent special districts include the Emergency Medical Services Authority and Pinellas Planning Council and MSTUs include the unincorporated area municipal services unit, the Public Library Services District, Palm Harbor Community Services District, Feather Sound Community Services District, East Lake Library Services District, East Lake Recreation Services District, and the Special Fire Protection Districts. Number four, if you, if you wish to speak regarding the tentative millages and tentative budgets, you should have filled out a blue card. If you have not yet filled one out and you wish to speak, please see the staff sitting at the back of the, uh, the, the room here, and they'll assist you. For all the pre-registered online participants, you will be instructed at the proper time to raise your hand in the virtual meeting. And my understanding is that we don't have any 
people that have, have called in or are calling in. That is correct. Thank you. Um, number five, after hearing all public comment, I will ask the board if they recommend any further changes to the tentative millages or tentative budgets. If so, I will ask the board for a motion and a vote to adopt any changes. Number six, finally, we will adopt the resolutions of the FY22 tentative millage rates and tentative budgets, will be, which will be the basis for the final budget public hearing that will be held on Tuesday, September 21st at 6 p.m. In accordance with Florida statutes, the tentative millage rates will be adopted first and then the tentative budget will be adopted for each taxing authority. Number seven, before we begin this public hearing, if anyone has specific questions or concerns regarding the assessed value of their property, exemptions, or classification related to your property, or information on the trim notices, tonight we have here for you Kevin McCune, McKeon, excuse me, the Deputy of Assessment Administration, please, there you go, thank you, uh, from the Pinellas County Property Appraiser's Office. If anybody would like to speak with him, please follow him at this time and he will answer your questions. For those attending virtually, please contact the Pinellas County Property Appraiser's Office at 727-464-3207, Monday through Friday, eight to five, or email Mike at pcpao.org. I'm just going to give you that number again. 727-464-3207, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, or email mike at pcpao.org. Number eight. Florida statutes also provide that a taxing authority may adopt the tax levies and budgets of all its dependent special districts and MSTUs by a single unanimous vote. However, if a member of the general public requests that the tax levy or budget of a dependent special district or MSTU be separately discussed and separately adopted, we will then discuss and adopt the district's tax, district's tax levy and budget separately. At this time, does any member of the general public attending the meeting in person request separate discussion or separate adoption of a tax levy or budget of any dependent special district or MSTU? Mr. Chair, just to confirm again, there are no individuals who have pre-registered to speak on the tentative FY22 millage rates or budgets. Okay. Since we, since we have not heard from anyone requesting separate discussion and separate adoption of any dependent special district or MSTUs, we will proceed with the adoption of the tentative millages and tentative budgets for the dependent special districts and MSTUs by single unanimous vote. We will now open the first public hearing on the FY22 millage rates and budgets. This public hearing is being held in accordance with chapters 129 and 200 of the Florida statutes. The meeting has been duly noticed by the property appraiser's mailing of the trim notice. Thank you. Um, we, the Board of County, uh, of, of County Commissioners, as taxing authority for the BCC countywide de dependent special districts and MSTUs, as previously referenced, will now proceed with the public hearings. In accordance with Florida statutes, I want to publicly note that the percentage increase in the millage rate for all budgets over the rollback rate based upon the maximum rates on the trim notice and subsequent decreases to such rates to fund the FY22 tentative budget is, 1 is a 1.93% increase over the aggregate rollback rate. The primary purposes of the increase in millage over the rollback rates are due to the following. 
in the general fund, including unincorporated area MSTU, and in the Emergency Medical Services Authority, revenue increases are required to support personnel and operating expenditure levels that are driven by inflationary factors. In the planning, Pinellas Planning Council, revenue increases are required for the same purposes as per the request of Ford Pinellas. In the Public Library Services District MSTU, the Palm Harbor Community Services MSTU, the Feather Sound Community Services MSTU, the East Lake Library Services MSTU, East Lake Recreation Services MSTU, and five special fire protect protection districts, revenue increases are needed to support increased expenditures by the agencies providing the services in those districts. In the other seven fire sp fi special fire protection districts, the revenue decreases or are due to those districts having sufficient reserve levels to provide for future planning, planned capital, along with property values that can support annual operations. Chairman, before we begin the FY22 budget presentation, I want to note that a schedule of changes to the proposed budget was distributed to the board on September 2, 2021, and attached to the agenda packet available online. Modifications include both changes discussed at BCC meetings or work sessions and technical adjustments related to the accounting presentation, updated information, corrections, and other minor revisions. We'll now continue with the FY22 budget overview presentation. Go ahead. So as you can see, the good part we're talking about today is we're talking about how much to roll back the property tax rate. This has not been done since 2007. The general fund currently, uh, or cur the current proposal is that it would roll back to a millage of 5.1302 mills, which for the average residential homeowner is a $25 savings per, um, over um, what would have been at the full millage. This partial rollback rate adds um, 1 .1279 millage, which is $12 million, to additional capital for uh, sidewalks and roads. The health department millage at 0 .0790 mills is an, a $7.88 for the average homeowner savings over what would have been at the full um, rate. The, this is a, the first voluntary decrease since f uh, fiscal year 97. So in both of these scenarios, we're putting more money towards capital and we're rolling back the property tax rate. So that's a very, very good news story that we're presenting here to, for you tonight. The unincorporated fire districts decreases for eight of the 12 districts, savings approximately 81% of our unincorporated properties. So as far as the total budget, uh, the total budget that we're looking for you to adopt is $2.9 billion. Um, as is reflected on the screen, it's about a 4.9% increase versus the FY21 revised budget. Um, however, excluding reserves, it's a 5.5% decrease versus FY21 and a 7.2% decrease, even more decrease when you look at a two-year span from comparing to FY20. Uh, your total general fund expenditures more specifically are increasing only 0.7% versus FY21 while still achieving a lot of the important objectives that you wanted to support uh, as part of the adoption of the budget, including uh, public safety, public health, and other areas. And if you compare the general fund expenditures in the budget proposal versus FY20, it's 2.4% decrease, or $20 million that we're decreasing over the two-year period. Looking at specific changes to the proposed budget, was, which was presented on July 13th to you, uh, Barry already mentioned the dedicated ad valorem support for transportation in the amount of $12 million. Uh, we have carry forward for emergency rental assistance funding, um, and that's to continue that program into FY22. Uh, we received ARPA funding 
uh, American Rescue Plan Act, specifically for the home program. That's distinct and separate from the $189 million that we have uh, more flexibility with that we'll talk about at our work session next week. Uh, next, our reimbursement of staff expenditures from CARES. Uh, so we did talk about the fact that one of the things we we're going to do is reimburse ourselves for some small portion of CARES as a result of the work that our staff did, the thousands of hours that the staff dedicated to those programs. Uh, so that's part of the changes from the 22 budget uh, that was proposed originally. Uh, additional sheriff revenue. Uh, we talked about, uh, and the sheriff talked about renegotiating the contract for jail inmates with the U.S. Marshal Service. And as a result of that renegotiation, there's an estimated increase of $3.7 million annually uh, for the housing of those inmates. Uh, increased ambulance contract for paramedic pay, we uh, you all approved last month. And then at the meeting earlier today, the increased public emergency medical transport revenue. Other changes, uh, reduction of five FTEs in BTS, uh, redu reduced cost for the third party administrator for workers' comp claims, that was also approved by you earlier today as far as that contract. Uh, updated estimates and carry forward to FY22 in the various budgets since July. Uh, additionally, various grant awards and contracts for services that were recalibrated. And on the user fee side, we had talked about when we adopted the, uh, the proposed budget and brought that forward to you and presented the user fees, that there was a credit card convenience charge that was being added as a result of changes in the technology that we're using. It's similar to what we're already doing in utilities and a couple of other areas. We're doing that with a couple of more. And instead of having that on an individual departmental basis, we're putting it in for the entire user fee schedule so that as we have new technologies come online that enable us to do this, we're able to do that on the fly instead of waiting until the annual budget cycle happens each year. Uh, and then also in the airport, uh, they're increasing the short-term parking daily maximum rate, and that's a strategy to address some parking shortages that they have, where because the rate is so low, both within the airport itself and then also compared to its peers, uh, people are parking in short-term when they really are staying long-term. Additional changes uh, within the Capital Improvement Program, uh, Restore Act, uh, which you may recall the BP uh, settlement, uh, Restore Act was part of that, and there's um, funding at a regional level that we're receiving for a mobile home wastewater collection systems design. Uh, we're very excited about that because that's gonna help us with a huge problem that we've had for a long time in helping those mobile homes be safer and a better place to live, and then also dealing with I&I &I problems that we have as a result of those systems as well. Um, utility cybersecurity improvements, we've made a change to be able to increase uh, funding for that. Uh, water meter replacement project, there was a change in the project schedule there and an increase in the total project. And then within solid waste, the waste to energy and industrial waste treatment project uh, increases, uh, those are made both as a result of changes in the CIP planning schedule as far as the timing, and then also increases based on changes in costs as we've gone through the process of getting to contracts. And then as far as our budget timeline as of what's coming next, as uh, the chairman mentioned, our next public hearing will be on September 21st at 6 p.m. That's when you will adopt the final millages and budgets uh, for FY22. October 1st is the start of the fiscal year, and then October 20th is a statutory date by which we have to have the FY22 budget posted online. However, we always endeavor to get it done earlier, and with our new software and the progress we've made there, um, I think we'll get it online a little bit earlier than we did last year, which was very close to the deadline. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Any questions on the presentation? Uh, yes, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the three million plus that you talked about, the sheriff being able to realize as a result of the increase for the uh, Marshall holes, was that? Um, integrated as a part of the original budget presentation that we had for the sheriff or is that so what was bill, what bill was covering are changes to what was proposed to you during the budget okay and so, so this that, is an that, increase yes so okay. that was an increase that was a contract that he negotiated um and that becomes additional revenue available for our um use okay would that i'm sure we'll talk about whether or not that can be 
substitute it for maybe some other dollars that we put in. Um, well, we, we fund, there, as you recall, there were a number of, of, of things in the sheriff's, uh, that was our largest area of increase. Um, but he also, in turn, went and increased uh, revenue, too. So it was a very good thing. Um, we didn't say, okay, you increase this and we'll give you this. These were needs that he had. He's increasing a mental health unit, very uh, closely aligned with your strategic priorities. Um, and we increased safety out on the water. And some, so some of those, those are real needs. So we made that recommendation separately. He was working on that contract and he delivered. Um, and, and produced an additional $3.7 million for us. And that'll go in perpetuity. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Seal. I, yes, thank you. I have um, three questions. My first one is, um, it's not really a question, it's a comment. Thank you very much, Bill, for all of your hard work over all these years. This is the last budget you're going to present to us. And um, when is your last day? October 1st. October 1st. Oh. <laughs> Budget year. How did I, how did, <laughs> anyway, thank you most sincerely for, um, always have trusted everything that you've done and um, we will miss you greatly. Thank you. So, um, my next question, my two questions are the following. One is uh, the CARES reimbursement for the county staff. I know it's kind of done department by department, but um, rather than me going and using my calculator and adding it up, do we have an estimate about how much that is? Um, in the aggregate, the change that we made for this version of the budget is about $10.5 million. Okay. Um, that being said, we are still working on finalizing the reports. That's one of the things I've committed to in addition to uh, working, walking us through the budget process is closing out the CARES CRF uh, reporting. Um, so by the time we get to October 1st, we'll know what the final number is. Okay. All right, thank you. And then the second is just kind of a question, but also a comment. Um, while I'm going to support the budget, I know that in December we're having a workshop about the uh, water meter replacement project, mm -hmm. and that change in project is a pretty huge increase. Mm -hmm. So I would, I'm holding my judgment whether I'm going to support that. I, I know we need to approve the budget. A budget is a budget. Things change, and so therefore. It, it is, and if you if you make a change to that schedule or the way in which we're implementing the project, that's an enterprise fund, so it doesn't go anywhere else. It would just be free available dollars that would be roll into their fund the next year. Right, but this is a pretty large increase, so I am a little concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And then I know at some point we'll also have a discussion about the regional resource recovery facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any any other questions um, on the budget? Um, Commissioner Peters. Um, Bill, why did you do the excluding reserves? And I got questions about reserves. So why why did you do the excluding excluding just to help me understand why you're doing what you're doing? Why did we do excluding reserves? So the, the reason for trying to provide that perspective is when you look at the total budget and it includes the reserves, the reserves are not uh, monies that we will be spending. We're setting those aside for various purposes. And okay. if we're comparing, we want to make sure that we're giving you a perspective of what are we committing ourselves to expend year over year. Okay. And we felt like that's a different perspective that may add value in providing more context to yourselves and the citizens about what we're actually spending as opposed to what we have in the bank account. Okay, so how about if we talk about reserves? So last year, do you now know what we collected in 2020 in reserves? It was projected 31 million, what did it turn out to be? I'm sorry, we don't actually collect reserves. Reserves are monies that we set aside so that we do not spend them. Okay, so, so last year you projected we were gonna set aside $31 million. Property values went extremely higher, so we know we collected more than $31 million. I'm curious what we collected last year. So in terms of the way the collections work, the fact that the real estate market is changing during the year doesn't change what our collections are because the tax roll is set in January of, and I'll use FY22 okay. as an example, the FY22 budget. The property appraiser sets the values as of January 1st of 2021. Okay. Those values are what are used to develop the FY22 budget and the tax bills for FY22 upon which that budget is based. Okay. So once that assessment is set, 
on January 1st, absent a value adjustment board change, which someone may appeal, um, absent those changes, that sets our budget and it does not change. So we cannot and do not collect any more revenue as a result of the market changing. It wouldn't be until the subsequent year when he assesses the role once again that there would be an opportunity to collect additional revenue. And that's the basis by which we made the decision to recommend rolling back the rate as we've described. Okay, thank you, that's helpful, I appreciate that. So what is the projected amount that will go into reserves? What did you, what did you minus out of this? What did you exclude out? What is the projected amount that'll be set aside for reserves for this fiscal year? So our general fund reserves that are budgeted are 22.2%. And the total amount of dollars associated with that is 159.3 million. And that and is how much more than last year? That's actually the a dollar decrease. Number, dollar number. That's a decrease of two and a half million dollars from last year. Okay, so we projected 31, so you're saying we're projecting 28, maybe 29? I, I guess I, I'm not following I, the, the, the math where you're uh, taking okay. the 31 or, and the 29, it, I'm sorry. It's the 31 from what we, we said we were not going to increase our spending, but we were going to put the additional money that was collected last year off of keeping the rate the same. Is that where, where you're going with that? So, so remember last year I asked the question that if we left the millage rate the same, it was a tax increase, and you said, yes, it is. It's a $31 million tax increase, right? So, so and you said that we were not going to spend it, that we were going to put it in reserves, and I understand all that. I understand why there was a lot of unknown. I understand all that. And so I just want to understand, because we never really talk about reserves very much, so I just want to talk about reserves, if that's okay. So, so we are doing a rollback, which makes me happy, and even if we did the rollback, that means that we collect exactly the same amount of money as last year. I understand that. I understand we have more expenses, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you said last year that we would collect so much money it was going to go into reserves, and what I'm asking you this year is how much money are we going to collect this year that's projected to go into reserves, just like you told me last year, $31 million. What is it projected this year? So we're projecting that we will be actually reducing Correct. reserves by $2.5 million two if and we million move dollars. forward with what is proposed. Okay, so that $2.5 million, if we collect the same as we did last year, which we're not, we, we, we didn't go to the rollback, so we're not, we're collecting more than that. And I understand what we, what we put in on we're spending. So I'm trying to figure out that if at rollback, last year we would have collected $31 million, that if we went to rollback this year, minus the two and a half million, would put us at 28, about well, 20 million. Well, last year we million. collected more because the rate stayed the same. This year we're doing a rollback, but you're increasing an, um, an amount that then goes over to the Transportation Trust Fund. I, uh, sir, so I, we're not I, increasing I, our reserves. I, under I understand that, but you're still collecting money for reserves this year. And that's what I'm trying to, you are still collecting money for reserves. No, we're not. We're, you are not collecting any money for reserves this we're year. We're spending sir. down reserves by two and a half million dollars. So. And that we, was the difference in last year. Last year we said we want a cushion to, to because of the, we didn't know what was going to occur with revenue from the economy. So, and so you, we, we was a purposeful put of putting the 31 million you're talking about into reserves. This year it's a drawdown of that. We're not putting additional okay. money into reserves. So no money, no money in this budget is going in reserves? Correct. Okay. And, and if I could provide a little more context also, um, because one thing that one may think is, okay, you collected $31 million additional that you put into reserves last year. If you're keeping the revenue the same, then wouldn't you have, and I understand now that you've talked through it a little bit more, wouldn't you be in the $28, $29 million range that we're collecting? Well, in addition to decreasing the rate, keep in mind that one of the reasons the reserves are decreasing by only $2.5 million is because of some of the changes we just talked about, which include the $3.7 million additional for the sheriff and the $10.5 million additional that we're paying ourselves back for CARES. Yeah. Okay. So those are factors that make the reserves look better than they would otherwise. Okay, okay. I just want to be clarif clarified on that, so thank you. Okay, any, uh, any other questions? Um, okay, thank you. Um, at this time, we'll take public comment from those. Oh, wait a minute. Let me make sure I get the uh, wrong place. We will now continue this public hearing as taxing authority for the BCC countywide dependent special districts and MSTU levies by taking public comment from citizens who wish to be heard regarding the FY22 budget. Since the beginning of the meeting, do I have any blue cards? No. 
no blue cards from the public comment. Um, and I'm assuming we still have none that, uh, obviously we had no pre-registration online and we're, we're not taking any. Um, because that is weren't. correct, Mr. Chair. Okay. okay. Now that we've heard all public comments, in which case there were none, uh, does any member of the board recommend any changes to these tentative millage rates or tentative budgets? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I. Sorry, we had this conversation um, a couple weeks ago. You're not on there. Yeah. I pushed it. Okay. So I know we had a conversation a couple weeks ago about the Transportation Trust Fund. And we were kind of at a stalemate, and then there was this, oh, okay, well, I'll go along just so we can move it along. But, but this is, you know, and I want to go back to that. I, I really do, because, you know, our, our citizens have gone through a really tough time. You've heard me kind of rant about it more than you want to hear anymore, I'm sure. Um, but since, and, and by what we did, instead of going with a five-year plan on that trust fund, we put every property owner on the hook for paying for that wear and tear on our roads and the work that has to be done. We didn't put it on the tourists. We didn't put it on non-property owners. And if we had done the five-year plan, we could have in two years after people had recovered from this pandemic and the impact that the businesses and, uh, and people that have lost employment would get through and have had trouble making rent, if we would have waited two more years, instituted that gas tax, that would have extended that what, another five years, you all said, on that gas tax. And in those two years when you do that gas tax, then now you have 30% of the tourists will be paying into that trust fund, not just our property owners. You would have people that are non-renters. that are, All these people are using our road. All of these people are used doing the wear and tear on the road. And by going to the biggest one that do, does a 14-year, it puts us out to 2035, you have now put that trust fund solely on the back of the property owners in this county. So the tourists that are doing the wear and tear on this roads are not contributing. The business people that come through, the, the, non, the, the renters, the non-property owners that do the wear and tear on the road are not paying into this trust fund now. And so instead, we put this on the backs of our property owners. And I think that we made a mistake on that. I really do. And I would propose, since we had close to a majority on the middle one, I would propose that we don't do the 5.1302, but that we do the 5.1088, where we were close on a lot of people, and that isn't even doing the five-year. That's, that's giving you till 2028. You know, personally, I think we should have done the 5.982, done five years and put it on the backs of our ta property taxes, and then instituted that gas tax. You're gonna get the long range from there. And a lot of things can happen in five years with, um, with new technologies and so forth, so and new laws and new things that are coming forward. And I just don't think that we should put the Transportation Trust Fund on the backs of just the property owners when throughout history we've spread it out over tourism and non-property owners. And so I, I, I would recommend, <laughs> what I really want to recommend is the 5.0982 and really give people a real break on their taxes for a change. They've gone through a really tough year and a half, it'll be two years, where restaurants couldn't open up normally like they could because they couldn't get staff to come in and work. Um, people are missing work. People are having struggling paying their bills and paying their rent. We, we're talking about that with, the, with people getting their rent, people getting evicted, and yet, we're gonna put this on the property owners and we shouldn't, I don't think we should. And so I would propose that we don't go to the maximum millage rate that we're suggesting at 5.132, but maybe compromise into a 5.188, which would give the Transportation Trust Fund again on the backs of the property owners through 2028 instead of 2035. And I don't know if that makes sense to you, but we have raised their water bill, we've raised everybody's sewer bill, We've raised everybody's garbage. We've raised the tipping fees. We have raised and raised and raised and raised. And all I'm asking for is just give the taxpayers and property owners a break yeah. for a short period of time and then institute the gas tax. That gives you plenty of time till 2028 in which you can institute that and then spread that over better um, to the people that, all, that everybody should be contributing to. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah Commissioner Gerard. Just wanted to respond to that. The uh, 
I don't remember what the calculation is, but the gas tax, had we implemented it, and we need to because we need money for maintenance of roads and sidewalks and that sort of thing, would have cost a lot more than what we're proposing in the millage rate. Just want to say hundreds of dollars more. My tax bill on my trim notice is going up $12. Um, yeah, Commissioner Seale. And I would concur and I would ask Bill to tell, my um, notes show that the this increase only takes us through fiscal year 2031, not 35. And maybe I, that's just from. It's we, in the presentation on the slides. Okay. That's 35. It, it is 35. Okay. Commissioner Peters is correct. The uh, last presentation that we provided okay. uh, that mapped out the $9 million option, $10 million option, and the $12 million option that is now presented to you uh, showed that it will take us out to FY35 mm -hmm. at the $12 million option. Okay. Thank you. Um, I. Um, we have talked about the Transportation Trust Fund for years and years and years. And I, the reason that I propose doing this is because if at some point that we can do an electrical vehicle user fee or some other user fee, we can address it at that point. Because if you look at the budget, we were supposed to, they had budgeted putting the gas tax in. Um, in reality, the Transportation Trust Fund um, is a 5.5 million, it's almost 5.6 million increase. So the gas, since the gas tax is off the table, then this is not as high as it could have been. Um, you know, people care about basic infrastructure. I think I've learned about, if nothing else over all these years, is that they want their roads paved, they want to not trip over cracks in the sidewalk, they want to have a safe way to travel around this county, and I'm proud of what we do because when you go over to some of our neighboring counties and you drive on their roads or you see what their drainage is during a heavy rain, it it's not what it needs to be. But we have parts of this county that look like it's in a third world nation, quite frankly. And so we really do need to continue to address um, making sure that we have adequate and well-paved streets and sidewalks and. Um, and that basic infrastructure that people expect in their daily lives. So um, we are seeing savings. The health department alone is on $7.88 a person. Um, I could have made the argument that we look at that funding for health and human services and for the homeless and for, you know, health care and some other things, dental um, needs in our community. But I agree that we need to roll back the rate to a certain extent and provide some savings to everybody. And then finally, tourists do pay for property taxes indirectly when they stay in a room. Any good business person is going to factor property taxes into their room rate because that is an expense to them. So while you don't have somebody say that you can say, well, they're paying that gas tax directly, it is an indirect contribution to our economy. So I am comfortable with where we are going. We are protecting the future, which has um, always been critically important to this commission. And um, I thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and just a couple of points. One, it was decided nobody wanted to do the gas tax uh, a few weeks ago and provide a larger property tax reduction with being able to enhance those services that we're talking about, enhance the infrastructure that we're talking about. So that's where we got to here. And then the other point I would simply make is that while we talked a lot about this is a five year, six year, 10 year, whatever, it's a one year. This is a one year budget. This has not set us down a path for five years. There's no guarantees next year that the millage rate, what we'll do with it, where we'll spend it. So. Um, and I understand that's how we looked at it, projecting it out, but this is a one-year budget, not a five- or ten-year plan. Anybody? Yes, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think one of the things that we discussed last time 
as well as having an opportunity to focus on the budget this way will allow us not to have to implement a gas tax. And we received a number of emails from our constituents saying, please don't increase the gas tax if you're going to keep your millage rate the same. And so the overall discussion was we set aside the gas tax, gas tax conversation and we looked at a rollback rate um, that we could implement that would still give us the revenue that we needed to provide the functions that the county needs. We also um, will have an opportunity, I would hope, um, because I think it was Commissioner Seal that talked about the fact that we need to put together a strategic plan related to the gas tax for the future and just not wait until it gets to the point where it's depleted. And so now we're looking at adding that in. In addition, I believe it's only about a dollar and some change difference when we look at the options. A dollar can buy maybe a half a loaf of bread. I'm not being facetious. A dollar could buy maybe a half a loaf of bread. It could buy meat. It could. It, it's a symbol of decreasing the revenue, but it is not so intent for me that I would look at going back any further because it will make that much of a difference to the constituent. I believe, um, for me, in good faith, rolling back the rollback rate to something that we could endure that would allow us to continue to provide day-to-day -day functionality of the, con of the county, addressing the issues. We've all received emails about people with these orange cones over the sidewalk until we can get to it. Now we can speed those processes up and get to some of those projects much sooner and make it safer. Um, and I believe that the tourists that are coming here that are utilizing our services, whether it's roads, sidewalks, hotels, et cetera, they still pay into the base for what it is that we have here. And I am seeing more and more individuals are purchasing property here and actually utilizing this as another home base. So they're not getting um, the homestead exemption from any other revenue sources that we will be able to derive from. They're not getting any of that because they um, this is not their primary home. So I'm going to go ahead and, and support what we've been, what appeared to be the thought process from the last, I'm not going to say what we voted on, what appeared to be the thought process of the majority of the board members, not kicking the can down the road, but looking at 2035 where we've had a chance to actually put together some concrete strategies to deal with the transportation issues and concerns further down the road, but to also make a mindful impact to our constituents when it comes to moving to the rollback rate. We've not done this, the county hasn't done it since what, 1997 or so? For the eight and a half years I served on city council, we never went back to the rollback rate. We just couldn't afford to do that based on the financial constructs at the time. But now we have an opportunity to make 20 plus dollars um, of savings for constituents. And I think it is a move in the right direction. It's not as much as perhaps we would like, but I surely believe it's a move in the right direction. The final thing that I wanna say is with us taking this movement, we have not put money into reserves because there was there were additional dollars that were there as a result of the decision that this commission made previously. And we were able to kind of peel away from that to pay for a number of things that came up that we would not have been able to pay for had you all not made such a conscientious decision um, at that time. So those are my comments. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's just a I'm not going to be redundant because we had this conversation in depth the last time that we met. But I did want to second Commissioner Seal's comments, and I think somebody else alluded to it. I am very, very proud of how this commission has put our budget together, and we have sat through hours and hours of listening to our department heads and our staff talk about their piece of this budget. And the one thing that I've truly enjoyed is that everyone's fingerprints are on this budget. It hasn't been developed by any one person. It's been developed by everyone in our county personnel system that has an impact on the budget with lots and lots and hours of input. I uh, have listened very carefully to all of my colleagues' comments, and um, because c c there are several of us here that have served in the state legislature, 
including Commissioner Peters, I want to say, you know, if we had honest, honest brokers that were our partners in the legislature, we would be recommending a vehicle miles traveled mm -hmm. component within the taxing structure of our state. Because we have known for two decades or more that technology was changing the way in which transportation happens and the way in which we are fueling our economy. And also, every single year that I've been on this commission, we have asked for an expansion in the tourist development portion of our taxes so that our tourists would be having a, a real say-so in how those dollars are spent. And if that was expanded to allow for certain types of infrastructure, then we could use it for that as well. Um, we, you know, if, if we keep on relying on the same things we've always done, we're going to get the same result. So I'm very proud of the way we put our budget together. It's been very, very thoughtful, and, and we've all worked really hard and spent hours on it. So I'm especially proud of you, Bill, and your staff that have worked tireless, tirelessly not just through our regular process, but all year round to answer our questions, help explain to us no question was ever too dumb or too stupid for you to really, you know, pay attention to. And I am very grateful to you. I know that Chris will do a good job, but you are filling big shoes, Chris. Just know that. And I wish you great speed and lots of good health and fabulous adventures, which we're all going to be very jealous to hear about. So good luck to you, Bill. Uh, okay, with all of that said, those are my comments, Thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank, Thank you, you for letting me share. Yeah, um, yeah, Bill, I wanted to echo the comments that are raining down on you, um, but also, but really to you and your staff have been just first rate over the years. Um, I. Um, from the first time I got here, uh, going through the process in such detail and, you know, trying to explain all of the intricacies of this massive budget that, that we put together. And um, you just brought it clarity to it and obviously brought a process that was very consistent from year to year and, and very transparent, at least, you know, for, for me. And I, and I really want to say thank you for your professionalism. Um, for your staff's dedication to, you know, success and, and just just incredible work. So, um, yeah, and I wish you the very best um, in, in the coming year. Um, yeah, for me, this is, you know, this has been a little bit tough because I, I, I was thinking back to last year when we were um, in a very, a very scary time. And we start this budget process in January or February. I mean, it's a long process. They barely get the, the, the budget put together, bound up, and, all, and, and the staff's starting to meet. We have our strategic planning meeting, and um, we start that, that, that ball rolling. So it's, it's a year-round year, year round thing. But last year, we cut expenses, and we kept the property tax increase for a reason. And we said it was to build our reserves, and we did. And we have a nice reserve. It's, it went for the longest time, it was in the, in the mid-teens, you know, 16, 17, it's up to over 20, whatever, 22%, 23%. And, and, uh, but the idea was, and I remember Barry saying this, that we were going to look at a two-year budget. Not often do we do that. As Commissioner Justice said, it's usually a one-year budget at a time. But it was important, given where we were, that we ant tried to anticipate the downturn in the economy uh, that we were assuming was going to happen, sales tax reductions, property tax reductions. We wanted to have reserves to help us through. And, um, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen like we were concerned with. And, and the ad valorem receipts and all of that kept our reserves to a point where we really are going to give back money. That, the idea behind the rollback was to do that, to give back some of those reserves. I was a little surprised when we first talked about the reserves going down as little as they were, um, because, you know, frankly, I would have thought we would have gone. I know that you have a five year plan to use some of those reserves, but nonetheless, I thought we could have perhaps brought those down just a little bit more. Um, but 
it really isn't about the dollar and cent. It may be to somebody, but for me, it was really about when you gave us three options to try to keep that gas tax fund fiscally sound, that we would, I mean, we're talking five years at the greater of the, of the uh, I guess it was the $9 million option. Uh, it was through 2026 that that fund was was secure. And everybody keeps telling me that electric cars are coming and they're going to be here in three to five years. I'm telling you gas tax funds are going to be getting harder to deal with. And just because of that, I, I think that the, the feds or the state or both are going to be having to deal with that issue. And they're going to have to take up the, as you, point, you talked about, Commissioner Long, the vehicle mile model to getting it fairly distributed. I think our gas tax fund is, is broken. Uh, I don't think it's structurally sound in terms of how it's put together and how the funds, the revenues are charged and all of that and a lot more conversation about working with our partners and how that split works out and all of that. We need to look at it and um, five years is enough time in my mind and, 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 and if it's not, then we have to do the tough thing and then maybe raise the millage just a little bit at that point to start to offset things going forward. Um, I, I just think it's a symbolic thing more than anything. And again, I think there are some people who might benefit from that, that, that bit of money, but it is a symbolic thing to say we did what we could to be fiscally prudent. Um, and to me, fiscally prudent is bringing a budget in. And, and the things that you've brought together, Barry, in this budget are just great. Some of the uses of the reserves, I think, are first rate getting rid of our sidewalk, or at least getting it caught up, sidewalk problem and all the issues that we have with that and a lot of other infrastructure issues. But we also have some other infrastructure challenges too. Um, and we're, you know, the Penny's doing a good job, but we need, we need some help on some of our sh uh, smaller neighborhood roads and, and that. Um, so there's ways that we can use um, reserves to, to, do, to, to help other areas of our infrastructure problem that the gas tax uh, is, to, is to work on. We ha also have the penny for Pinellas, which again is a big black box to me. We get a long list of the things that have been done. We get, we, we get told that there's a priority system developed by staff and, you know, hands off. And frankly, I'd like to have more hands on to make sure I clearly understand the process. So having said all of that, I'm not going to support the budget tonight. I think it should go all the way back to the $9 million level. I'm not interested in compromising at that middle number. I think we've got five years to try to tell our people in, in Tallahassee to, to help us structure a different system and make it right uh, so that it's, that it's shared by everybody, gas users, electric car users, and everybody it play, pays a part of it. So again, I'm not going to elaborate. We've gone into this a lot. I've tried to talk about my interests and my points, and so I won't be su supporting it tonight. Um, as we move forward, and those are my comments. Um, I, any other closing comments before we move to? Uh, no, let me make sure I'm on the right place. Section okay. four. Okay. Um, we're on page four. Correct. Okay. Section four. Yeah. Adoption of resolutions, tentative. Yes, you're gonna go right, right there. Okay. Thank you, Bill. I told you you needed that director's chair sitting right there so you could help me through this. Um, now that we have received all public comments, the board must now consider the resolutions to set the tentative millage rates and tentative budgets. As stated earlier, we will adopt the tentative millage rates and tentative budgets in the following sections. Um, first, uh, the BCC countywide to include the general fund and health department, and two, the dependent special districts and MSTUs. The resolutions adopting the millages and budgets for the dependent special districts and MSTUs require a unanimous vote. If a unanimous vote is not received, we will, we will need to adopt each of these separately. These resolutions adopt the millage rates and tentative budgets. The resolutions for adopting the millage rates and budgets are scheduled for the next public hearing on September, excuse me, on Tuesday, September 21st, 2021 at 6 p.m. I will now ask the county administrator to proceed with readings and for communications to display Schedule A that will be referenced during the readings and votes. I've got that up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will announce each resolution separately for the board's action. Per Florida statutes, the board will vote on the tentative millage first and then the tentative budget for each taxing authority. 
we will start with the consideration of the Pinellas County General Fund. For the general fund, I recommend adoption of a millage levy of 5.1302, which reflects a 2.5%, increase over the rollback rate of 5.0023. May I have a motion to adopt the tentative millage? I heard a motion by Commissioner Flowers, a second by Commissioner Gerard. Um, okay, yeah, okay, then go ahead, Barry. Oh, we, okay, number one, we got a motion, we got a second. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Uh, the, the tentative millage uh, passes five to two. I recommend adoption of the tentative budget. May I have a motion to adopt the tentative okay. budget? Uh, Commissioner Seal on the, on the motion and Flowers on the second. Um, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Motion carries five to two. For the health department, I recommend adoption of the millage levy of 0 .0790, which is the same as the rollback rate of 0 .0790. Second. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I recommend adoption of the tentative budget. So moved. Second. Commissioner Seal on the motion. Commissioner Flowers on the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We will now consider the tentative um, millage rates for the tentative bud and the tentative budgets of the dependent <laughs> special districts and MSTU. I recommend adoption of the tentative millage rates for the dependent special districts and MSTUs as detailed in Schedule A, which is on, in, your hand, in your paper handout being displayed and was previously posted to the county website. May I have a motion to adopt the tentative millages? Commissioner Seal on the motion, Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I recommend adoption of the tentative budgets. We have a motion to adopt the tentative budgets. Motion by Commissioner Flowers. Second. Second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Da, da, da. With that, unless the board members have any further comments, this first public hearing for the fiscal year 22 budget. Somebody got think, something to do besides be here? <laughs> is closed. Thank you. Commissioners, please note that the county will advertise the budget summary, the notice of tax increases in advance of the second public hearing in accordance with Florida statutes. The notice will be published in the Tampa Bay Times on September 19th. The second and final budget uh, hearing or public hearing will be held on Tuesday, September 21st at 6 o'clock p.m. We are adjourned.